it's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be talking about that interesting <laughs> cast announcement from Drag Race Down Under. We'll be breaking down each of the queens' promo looks and taking a small peek at their Instagram accounts to see if there's anything we can uncover. Crikey! And also I want you to let me know down in the comments below what your favorite part of that workroom entrance shot is. Is it that random piece of fabric laying on the floor? The uncentered, unclothed mannequin bodies? Maybe it's the little marble cupids? Or the bizarre signpost backdrop? Girl, was there no budget this time around? Regardless, don't get me wrong, I am super excited for the season. My mom always taught me not to judge a RuPaul's Drag Race season by its shoddily put together entrance workroom shot. And some of my favorite things come from Down Under. Flight of the Concords, Simmer Heights High, Cotney Act, Giant Roaches, and of course, Outback Steakhouse. Anyways, first up, I need a man and she needs a wiglet. It's a need a wiglet. Okay, this look is giving me like a oh, drag Madonna dinosaur working as your personal S&M butler, but she moonlights as a stained glass church window. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot going on here. I think the red stones are a really fun accent to this black and white ensemble. And I think the geometric lines and <sighs> shapes work in some part of the outfits, but maybe not others. For example, the way the outfit's put together makes it look like she's got this coffin shaped pussy <gasps> coming all the way up to her belly button. <laughs> She put that pussy in a sarcophagus. Kanye West predicted this. And also, I'm not sure if her cuffs are like dirty in the photo on purpose. Maybe she's trying to say she's had her wrist up somewhere it shouldn't have been. Ow, ow. <laughs> In that case, here's my number. I don't think it's a bad look, but this butler ultimately was not serving me a full plate. It's gonna be a rat. Oh, and I actually wore something similar, but with a lot less coverage on my OnlyFans account. DM me on Instagram for that link. I'm always so excited to see like who these queens really are. And some of them leave enough content on their Instagram for you to get a good idea before they join Drag Race. Okay, we've got a little kind of 60s mod thing happening there with that print. Oh, it's she's really excited. excited. Um, <gasps> Oop, peeped her wearing her entrance look. Oh, see, it looks so much better on a stage. It just looks so misplaced in this like uh, green screen dirt road backdrop thing that they've got going on, but it looks cute when, yeah, this is cuter with the kind of club lighting and stuff. I, I understand it more now. She has a lot of personality, and if we know anything about Drag Race, well, probably will take you pretty far. Next up, drag is art, and art is doing drag. It's Art Simone. But first, the number one question I've been getting recently is, where in the world are you watching RuPaul's Drag Race? On streaming platforms I already pay for with the help of award-winning VPN and today's video sponsor, Surfshark. For example, you can only stream stream certain seasons of Drag Race and other TV shows based on where you live in the world because streaming platforms geo-restrict their content. But with Surfshark, I can click one button and virtually relocate myself to the UK, for instance. Voila, fish, chips, and RuPaul's Drag Race. I also love Surfshark because it can protect your identity online, block ads and trackers, and hide your internet traffic from the prying eyes of your internet service provider, or snoopers on public Wi-Fi. And best of all, you can use Surfshark on all your devices with unlimited device logs. Login. Plus, there's no risk in just trying it out because Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you need a VPN, and everyone does, or you're just looking for a better one, then click the link in the description of my video and use code BUSSY during checkout to get 83% off and three extra months of Surfshark for free. Thanks, Surfshark, for sponsoring today's video. Okay, this look is very clean. It's very like American 50s housewife, and instead of baking pies as her hobby, she's picked up painting. It's also a little bit 80s with those pillow sleeves. It's a very cute look. I also love the asymmetricality of that collar matching with that really interestingly cut red corset. It really pulls everything together and brings, you know, cinches her really, really well. And I think really sets a high bar for herself. So that could be a dangerous move, but I have a feeling that she's got a lot of great looks up her sleeve for the rest of the season as well. But this look definitely painted with all the colors of the wind that I needed to see. It's but speaking of that Instagram and pre-drag race fame, well, she already had quite a bit of it. I mean, she was one of the first non-drag race famous drag queens that I remember following from the early days of when I started doing drag. You just go on that Instagram and this bitch knows how to paint. She knows how to do a wig. There is some amazing artistry. There's the name for you on this Instagram page. She kinda is coming off as that predetermined winner of the season. World of Wonder has already even given her her own mini series, Highway to Heels, I think it's called. <laughs> 
it's kind of like a slap in the face to the UK queens. Their main prize is to win a mini series from World of Wonder, and this bitch is coming straight onto her season already with one under her belt. Next up, she just woke up from a crazy night and all she could find to put on were these hotel curtains. It's Coco Jumbo. So this look is simple, but it's also very pretty and well done. I think the key to having a simple look on Drag Race and pulling it off effectively is it has to be perfectly tailored for your body. And this is. It's very like daytime Real Housewife going into the nighttime cocktail party tea gardens realness. The purple and gold brings a little regalness to it and that little slit is pretty cute. This look is hot. <laughs> over on her Instagram. Oh, those plastic spaghetti wigs. There's a couple queens in this season that have them in their promo looks. If I see those all over the runway this season, I'm gonna stop watching. Oh, she can paint too. She's very pretty. This oversized houndstooth print with the little chap cutouts. That's really cute. She seems very much like she's going to be bringing us a lot of real Womana fashion, all really well-made stuff. And it's not necessarily like over the top campy stuff and it's not necessarily super fashion forward, but what it is is well done, professional and looks damn good on her. Next up, they say the only things that'll survive the apocalypse are cockroaches, share, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Y'all can't say that was not a good one. As much as I hate roaches, this look is really cute. You better work, bitch. And I love the little campy details all over this outfit. The rhinestones on the little misshapen floppy antennae. The back of the dress is her cockroach wings. And then she's got her arms stuffed into these gloves that do not have finger holes. That's just a really great detail and remind you that sometimes drag is just about stuffing things into holes. And she did that successfully. Maybe this is a sign that she won't be eliminated easily. This look is hot. <laughs> Not me misspelling, etc. That's a hard word. That's a big SAT word, mama. Okay, follow. What do we have going on here, Miss Thing? Ooh. Oh, I like ye. She's a fascinator headpiece queen. Um, okay. <gasps> oh. Oh, leg. Oh. <gasps> Vivacious is shaking. Where are you out of drag? I want to see you without makeup on, Mama. Oh, I think he would be really cute with eyebrows. Next up, are you shocked? I am. It's Electra Shock. Mmm, this look. Um, she's got a great drag name, I have to say. Off the bat, Electra Shock. It, that's great. That really is. She really is also just living up to that shocked persona with that frizzy hair, too. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, I like maybe what she could have done with these giant sleeves and the cape in the back, but that bodysuit is, that's it, that is gutted. I'm so sorry. The way it frames her, sorry about my French, is really weird. Oh, it's really, really weird. And then all the rhinestones placed on the crotch makes it look like she's got razor bumps or something. I just, I cannot, I cannot. And there's like way too much going on in the neck with all the, the little strappies and the, the crystal necklace and the giant crystal earrings. I'm like, girl, let's take one of those things off. There's just there's too much going on here. Girl, sometimes in a bureaucracy, you just need to cut that red tape. This look is a over on the gram. Let's see if it's filled with electricity. Oh, it's got about nine posts. Okay. Honestly, we've seen some Instagram uh, old posts bite some of our queens in the ass this season. So probably best that she deleted all of her old content. Oh, Miss Bird thing. Oh my God. This is giving me like Moira Rose the crowing. Okay. This looks really pretty. I like the green, the little frills, the fluffies. Yep. There's not a lot here. Moving on. Idaho. Yudaho. Jojo's a hoe. She's giving me very much like 80s pop art Marie Antoinette is ready to go work the MAC makeup counters with her clear plastic bag that the security checks on her way in and out to make sure she hasn't stolen anything, of course. You know, I, I kind of like this. It's growing on me the longer I look at it, honestly, because it's fresh, it's fun, but also a throwback. Like it's one of those things we've seen a million times, you know, the giant bow bustle on the bussy, a classic moment, but never paired with a clear plastic raincoat dress that has like little lace on the hem and the little yellow bows on the stockings. Again, I don't know how much of the plastic spaghetti hair that I'm gonna be able to handle this season, but I think once or twice here and there, I'm gonna be okay with it. Miss Jojo's look is a hot ho ho over on the gram. Ooh, that was a good one. I've been practicing. Thanks for noticing. Oh, is that another spaghetti hair? Mama, oh. 
The white highlights on the skin thing is that she does this all the time. <gasps> oh my God, he looks like Raja here. Oh, he's really handsome. Wow, okay, hi. Next up, invest while you still can. It's Karen from the finance department. This look is so great. It feels very Bette Midler and big business to me. I think Rose would love this look. She's having a day out on the racetracks and she's betting on horses. 10 on Seabiscuit. And you know she means business because she has not only a flower on her collar, but an ascot, a bedazzled dragonfly brooch, and a hat. Mom. <laughs> How old is Karen? She also very much reminds me of that one high school secretary that we all had that notices you coming back from your off-campus lunch, gives you a nice little wave and pretends like you're all good, but then reports you to the principal office and before you know it, you're suspended. Karen, Karen, can I see the manager? Because you look hot. Over on the gram, let's find out how old, oh my God. Mama, what is this? Oh, that was just a look. Oh, that scared me. Leather face. I hardly know her face. Um, okay, Karen looking cute. Mm-hmm. Got some sequins, got lots of pink feathers. Okay. Oh, but if you're not wearing nails, <laughs> just kidding. Let me see who takes the makeups off. I want to see you without the drags on. Karen from finance, post a photo out of drag challenge. Okay, moving on. Next up, I told y'all gays love K. It's Kit Maine. I have to say her name like that because I know the YouTube little filters are gonna hear me say it the other way and get mad <laughs> and demonetize this video. Bro, that plastic spaghetti foam hair. What's going on here? Where are they buying this from? Is there a plastic spaghetti hair wig foam store that only <laughs> exists? down under. I'll give her a pass on it because I think this look is really cool. It's very... <sighs> Sailor Moon is a 50s housewife, but on an acid trip inspired by Lisa Frank. I think it is completely offensive to the eyeballs and I kind of hate it, but I also like kind of love it for those exact reasons. It's just those nasty like neon pastel colors, like five or six of them all put together into one and you're like, oh God. But you're also like, oh, that's really sick looking. Like girl, put a black light on her she's gonna be the life of the party oh and she's wearing her hearts on her hips how you know her hips don't lie <laughs> anyways this look is <laughs> over on her instagram it's kitty main oh wow okay she is oh really good at crazy clown drag makeup and i say that positively oh Wow. It's like Trixie-esque, but then if you mix that with like Ellie Diamond and Raven. Next up, it's Maxi Shield. Is there a pun there somewhere that I'm missing? Is it just supposed to be like Maxi Pad, but it's a shield? I like what she's doing with her hair, that purple blowout matching the purple sequin little jumpsuit situation. I think it's a cute look. I also love that giant tip. <laughs> but mama. What happened on the calves down there? When you scroll down to the bottom of this photo, this gorgeous little jumpsuit bodysuit thing completely cuts off to the calf cut. Why? And then what's worse is she's got just her plain nude tights tucked into her clear jelly heels. If I could like just give the top part of this look a hot, I would. But if you're gonna be exposing your calves like that, I wanna see your calves in full drag. I wanna see like two wigs down there. Because of what's happening down under in this photo, I'm gonna give this look a hot over on the gram. Wow. It loves her tits. She is fully breasted. Those things, they'll put your eye out, but they'll also put you in the hospital. <laughs> Little Easter bunny look, I love that. Ooh, this divine recreation, that's great. And finally, the newest member of the Adams family sure is looking cute. It's Scarlet Adams. Immediately, I love the fashion of this look. It's very Mugler woman, but on a little bit of a budget. I love the nod, of course, to her name, the solid red paired with that really short blonde hair too. I think it's really powerful. It makes a statement. And she's got the face to pull that off too, that sharp jawline. She has painted the house too, wow. The only issues I'm really having here is I wish that skirt was about three inches higher and I want her to take off the earrings and the scarlet choker necklace because I think those actually take away from the look more than they add. Regardless though, this look definitely stands out amongst the cast. I think she's going to try to be our fashion queen of the season. This look is a rah, 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 red hot. Over on the gram. 
<gasps> wool girl, she loves her color blocking. Oh, oh, oh. She did a full rainbow. Indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red for the cast announcement up to the rainbow. But why with a black heel? Oh, girl, take those off. Uh, whoa, hi, daddy, long legs. Oh my goodness. <gasps> oh. Oh, wow. Y'all, I'm getting a little flustered. <laughs> a man that can work a pole like that? I'm excited. <laughs> okay, before I tell y'all my hottest hat today, uh, oh my God. I just wanna say thanks so much for <laughs> watching this video and to remind you to press like if a dingo ate your baby and to press subscribe if the baby ate your dingo. <laughs> And I want to quickly remind y'all that patrons make my channel possible. Seriously, YouTube ad revenue does not cut it. My patrons are the reason that I am here doing the Bussy Queen channel today and making these hot or rot videos. So thank you all. My patrons also get exclusive member benefits like early access to my videos, access to my exclusive lip sync reaction videos that I post for every episode I review, access to chat with me in the Bussy Queen Discord server and more. Click the link in the description of this video to join my Patreon family today. And my hottest hot. For this promo reveal goes to Art Simone. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen, and they voted for Art Simone. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see y'all next time. Love ya, bye. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing the premiere of Drag Race Down Under. Today our queens were challenged to serve looks on the runway in two categories. New Delusion and a hometown inspired No Place Like Home. And for a little extra shrimp on the Barbie, I'll also be reviewing their blue carpet premiere looks. Crikey! Now let's jump right down to the dog's breakfast. First up... <coughs> Hmm. Bussy, are you going to film the whole season out of drag? Bussy, I didn't know you were there. Well, I can explain. My, my makeup artist had another gig today and I've already filmed 10 seasons of Drag Race this year. Can't I just take one small break? Silence! I don't want to hear any more tucking excuses from you, petulant fool! Be gone! Ah! <sighs> That's better now, isn't it? Let's try that again. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Bussy. <laughs> okay, before we get started, I have to give y'all a full disclaimer. My makeup, we had problems tonight. <laughs> I am fully aware that I am like missing and have spotty makeup on the top part of my lip, but I recorded this entire video anyways because I took it off and reapplied it about three or four different times. I don't know if my makeup that I was using went bad or what the hell happened. So enjoy my makeup slowly coming off as the video goes on and let me know what your favorite step of the makeup is. Is it when it's fully on or when it's just a complete mess like this at the end? Thanks. <laughs> First up, the newest member of the Adams family, Scarlett. For her premiere look on the blue carpet, she wore... <laughs> smells like 2012 Lady Gaga fan parfum ad. Hmm. Was the reference intentional or not? I don't know, but I do know Scarlett is somebody who loves and pays attention to fashion, so it's possible. I really love what she did with this. It's a statement piece, and you know what they say. The bigger the hat, the bigger the bat. This look is hot. For her nude illusion look, she comes out Fully nude. There's no illusion to it, okay? It's just like a little see-through red nightgown thing. I think she looks really pretty. I don't think that's ever gonna be the issue with Scarlett on the runway. She knows how to make herself look great. My problem here is that there really just was no bigger vision or anything beyond, hey, look at me, I'm pretty and I'm naked. <laughs> Which I guess you could say was just like a little bit down underwhelming in the era of drag where drag is so much more than just a man dressing up a woman and saying, hey, look at my big tits, look at my I'm sure that synthetic body thing was expensive, but it's a little bit boring for me. There was just no personality in this. And for that reason, this is gonna be a rat. As for her hometown Perth look, she is giving us a classic 2001 Bjork at the Oscars red carpet event. Fun fact, that Bjork dress from 2001 was hated by almost every single fashion critic ever when she wore it to the Oscars. And now it's one of the most iconic pieces of fashion history ever. Since Bjork had that moment on the red carpet 20 years ago, celebrities have either made fun of or or seriously interpreted this swan dress in many different ways. We've even seen kind of a little black swan interpretation from Melissa Edwards back on her original season. Katya owns a version of this dress somewhere. I've seen her dancing around in it. And now we have Scarlet. You know what? I think it's perfect. This look is packed. <laughs> 
The only thing I was super surprised about was on her Instagram post, she said the look was just inspired by the black swans in the river. And I'm like, what do you mean? This wasn't at all inspired by Bjork's original dress? Next up, you know, it just hit me that Australia is evidently full of size queens. Maxi Shield, Coco Jumbo, and look at this beaut on the blue carpet at the premiere. She looks gorgeous. This sassy little specimen just slithering down the carpet. I love the red piping detail on this snake gown, and this made me really, really excited for Maxi's fashion. This look is tight. And for her nude illusion look, she comes out in a see-through trench coat. She says that this is giving 90s Madonna trench coat in vogue. And I have no idea what she's talking about. Maybe y'all can let me know down in the comments below where I can find the reference for this because I was Googling and Googling and couldn't find it. I'm like, girl, did you make this up? Kind of iconic if you did. Again, she looks gorgeous, but does this look really like tell me who Maxi is? Not necessarily. Y'all will see what I'm talking about when we get to some of these later runways because these first First two I think are just not great examples of these queens showcasing and branding themselves for the nude illusion. But I do like that there was a little more thought put behind this runway than just, I'm naked. So I'm gonna give this one a soft, and in her hometown Bellina look, she threw another shrimp on the runway. <laughs> this is maybe one of the most ridiculous things we have ever seen on RuPaul's Drag Race. I had flashbacks to Bendilla Krim's fly costume thing she wore. It's very that, but then also I was like, oh my God, are we cracking the code in season seven again? Because Sasha Bell kind of already did this. And once I remembered Sasha, I could not unsee it. And if y'all want this conspiracy theory to intensify even further, you'll remember that the first runway on season seven was also also, a new delusion runway. Coincidence? I think not. This is high camp, full drag, and Maxi, this shrimp came all the way to a boil. This look is tight. Next up, Electra Shack. Unfortunately, she couldn't attend the premiere, so there's no look for that for her. She was reportedly still icing her balls from all those splits she did in the lip sync. But for her nude illusion, she gave us a classic gender-bent RuPaul reference. I love that Electra pulled this deep out of the RuPaul reference library, because Ru used to do so many fun things. Tons of gender-bent drag. There's that like really fun Satan look she did. The, of course, Confederate flag look she did is Rachel Tensions into Wang Fu. Anyways, as for Electra, as great as this reference is, it is always a risk to do Rue. <laughs> Just ask Trixie. I do have to say, while I respect what she did, I wanted to push that even further because this kind of gave me like Vegas showgirl that just threw on like a little bit of football armor on top and there was nothing on the bottom to complete the silhouette. She just kind of looked like an upside down triangle. The new delusion wasn't there and the reference just wasn't fully realized. I think this football player is gonna need to hit the showers. This look is a rat. As for her Auckland hometown look, what? in the John Dory. Did I use that right? Is that the right, correct phrasing of that slang? Y'all gotta let me know. Okay, let's start with the positives on this look, shall we? Okay, just kidding. I will say this though, her hair looks great. And that was like the one thing that RuPaul made a comment about. And I was like, girl, there's a lot you could talk about and you picked out the one good thing on the outfit. What was that about? And like Michelle said, I didn't understand what the hell was going on. Then she said she was a cloud. She's a thousand lovers. She was a lot of things, but I don't think she was a good representation of Auckland, but I also wouldn't know because I've never been there. Electra, I'm shocked. This is a rat. Next up, our other size queen, Coco Jumbo. Her premiere look, Womana, Gorgina, Bonzer? That's supposed to mean good, that's what Google said. Good day, blimey. <laughs> I have no complaints, she looks amazing. This is so, so hot. But her illusion runway was not perfect. It was pretty bad. I don't know if this was like an intentional Monique Hart reference or maybe Shea Coulee reference. Either way, it just didn't land. And the pieces, they were so overfilled. Maybe that's why they were saggy or they just didn't use the right stuffing material and then stitch them properly so that she wasn't just like melting on the runway. I just thought she was the calamari appetizer to Maxi shrimp. <laughs> this look sagged her all the way down to a rat. Next up, banana. I hardly know her. Planet of the Apes is in town. She is giving us a full monkey fantasy. This is so crazy. These queens are loving their campy costumes, which I'm kind of living for. They're really fun. The look is verging a little bit on like movie prop costume, but I think it's okay because it looks really well made and it's fun. And girl, if you're not having fun, you're not doing drag. Hot. Hell yeah. You know that ape suit is hot as tuck. Next up, 
so on and so on, etc., etc. At the premiere, they're giving me 30s velvet ball gown with a tasteful 60s updo that has this crazy alternative, like sharp bang cut into it. It's kind of alien esque, bug esque, almost like they're a cockroach thing. I don't know if that's gonna be a recurring theme with them, but I like it. And then take all that and throw Madonna's comb bras on there because they look beautiful. And yes, I'll be having dark meat tonight because that leg is looking scrumptiously. <laughs> As for their nude illusion, this is even immaculate. They're not just nude. They're not just illusionizing. Okay, this is a full story on the runway representing the non-binary journey. Half and half. They look ugh. Amazing. The way etc. self-branded this, told a story, and gave us fashion, this is exactly what I wanted from this runway. And it is hard to do, I think, with a category like this, but they did it. Etc.'s look was made with half and half and fully caffeinated. It's hot. And as for their hometown look, they say you can barely see this look from space. <laughs> They're giving me intergalactic glamazon. I have no idea what they were saying about the parliamentary triangle being seen in the structure of the bodice they're wearing. If somebody can tell me what the hell is going on with that, I would love to know. Regardless, I think this is Gorgina, amazing, stunning. Like my only real issue is that as somebody not from down under, it is kind of hard to understand what exactly this is supposed to be referencing and how it represents Canberra, because I know nothing about it. Overall, I was super impressed with this queen and I think they're gonna be one to watch. This look is packed. Next up, Jojo Zaho. RuPaul was just like laughing to himself every time he said Jojo's name. I was like, yes, Ru, we get it. We get the built-in pun. We, we, we understand, thank y'all. As for her premiere look, the post-drag glow up is Fire mama, she looks amazing. You can tell she's invested time into her makeup, hair, and outfits. I am loving this journey for her. I'm sorry that she didn't last longer on the actual season uh, because she had some really funny confessionals. The part where she was talking about, I'm gonna steal her outfit because she stole my land, I was gagged. Anyways, this look has Jojo looking pretty in pink. She looks hot. As for her illusion, where was it? This is kind of like Scarlet's for me. It's like, okay, you're just, Naked. I just wanted more of a story. I wanted more inspiration behind this. She kind of was just like, okay, I'm gonna stone this and then put on like three accessories and call it a day. Like I think the successful nude illusions on the runway are ones that hide some things and maybe they reveal them later, but you can't just give it all away for free up front. Mama, you gotta, you gotta lure them in. You gotta be like, oh, what's under this? What's under this? Oh, oh what about this? Anyways, the messaging of the outfit was great, but I think it got lost in translation. It's a rot. As for her hometown, it's Newcastle. Not the old one, the Newcastle. She's got a little bit of a Marie Antoinette thing going on. We've seen it a million times on the runway, so that's not necessarily novel, but I do love that she undid her bustle and showed us that little flag representing, she says that the land in Australia always was and always will be claimed by the original people that lived there. Again, the messaging here is great, but you have to also pair that great messaging with a great look. And the thing is, this really isn't a bad look. It's just for Drag Race in 2021, it's not up to the very high standard that Drag Race has now set for itself. You throw this back into an earlier season, this could have been very middle of the pack or maybe even a top placement. Anyways, with a little more attention to detail, I think this could have been a hot, but I'm going to leave it at a warming up. Next up, she works nine to five and still found time to do Drag Race. It's Karen from Finance. At the premiere, girl, Barney had something to say. <laughs> Stylistically, I hate this. I do not like this at all, but it's super well made. The silhouette is pretty. She is that campy secretary working the desk who also has to hit the red carpet at 7 p.m. after her shift. And this also very much has the Karen stamp on it. So that is why despite not actually liking this look, I can appreciate everything it stands for. And I really do think she worked overtime in this. It's hot. And for her new delusions, she is another queen that did something that was apparently very difficult to do tonight. She maintained her brand. You look at this, you know that's Karen from Finance's runway. You just know. The reveal with the tan lines was extremely smart. You can tell this is a queen that thinks about everything and that is going to take her so, so far. As an example, she even had carpet that matched her yellow drapes. This look was burning up. 
And over in her Melbourne runway, she's looking tragically beautiful. Karen is one of those queens with a very specific brand. She has squeezed herself tightly into this campy 80s secretary box. And I think it's gonna be really important for her throughout the competition to show that she is more than just the nine to five finance girl. And I think she is already doing that evident here on this runway. I thought this was a great way for somebody with such kitschy style to serve a little bit of fashion with that fun fascinator. Even though I was thinking, wait, if you're at the races, wouldn't you have a big sun hat on? I don't know, maybe they do it differently down under. Let me know. Anyways, all that is to say, I would bet big on Karen in this competition. This look is hot. Next up, Anita Wigglitz. I think she needs a hosting position on the kids TV show. This character is wild. I can't even do the face. How you do the face she does? She's like. At the premiere, she wasn't there either. Weird. Oh. So, sorry, there she is. Oh my God, I didn't even see her in that camouflage dress. What a legend, serving as tacky camo print, which I must look for. At 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney, no less. I couldn't really tell what she was up to at first, but once I figured it out, I realized this look is tight. And for her new illusion look, can y'all believe Anita Wiglet is actually the reason that we aren't all sitting up in heaven right now? Girl, you shouldn't eat that apple. She's giving us a little Eve in the Garden of Evil fantasy. Hey, we love a biblical reference on the runway, I guess. But real talk, I've been speaking a lot on branding for these queens, and Anita is actually a queen that I'm not sure who she is. She's so varied in her looks, and I can't really find like a common theme besides she's really excited to be there, which is fun, but I think it's gonna be important for her to stand out instead of blending in if you know what I mean. And while she looks pretty, this could have been way campier. Like, girl, give me a bigger snake. Who doesn't love a bigger snake? Ow, ow. <laughs> I don't know, gag me a little bit. Let's have some fun on the runway. Let's do drag. It was just a little lackluster. I think it's a rat. And over in Lay, New Zealand. That was not an Australian accent. And over in Lay, down under, New Zealand. Is that right? Oh, I should just quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> Anyways, this sheep look. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Um, it looks like she wrapped a couple of bath mats around herself. That's what it actually is well constructed. I think it's campy and fun. Gives us a little more personality, some insight into who this queen is. The only thing is, I actually wish this was her nude illusion with like some sheerness underneath the wool. I think that would've been way more fun. Again, who is this queen? I'm not so sure yet, but. This outfit is really fun. I'll give it a <laughs> And back on the blue carpet, it's Kit and Mean, Anita's partner in crime. I was totally gagged when they revealed the relationship between the three, like those two being Electra's boss. Like that would be such an awkward way to have a competition. Anyways, this look is giving me pastel 80s rocker chick has grown up, had a couple children and is now running the PTA meetings. There's also this weird tendency I've noticed for drag outfits to end up looking like ice skater uniforms. <laughs> For this one, I think it's the way those colored side panels are on the dress. It's just, mm, not for me. It's a rat. Next up, throw another ball in the Bobby. Okay, but seriously, who is Barbie and why does she love shrimp so much? What is that about? This look. This is if you combine Asia O'Hara's puff ball look from the last ball on earth and Aiden Zane's ball look that she made. My problem with this look is the pom-poms are too obviously pom-poms. I think when you're just gluing things to a cat suit or bodysuit like that, you need to have changes in density so that things look more visually appealing to the eye. Cause when they're all just evenly spaced out like that, it just looks awkward and you lose your shape and your eyes get bored. On top the fact that I just don't think this outfit has a true vision. She likes balls, but girl, don't we all. So this looks gonna be a rat. And in Auckland, more balls. You can never have enough balls. It's so weird that season 12 literally had a ball ball look. She did a look that kind of looked like one of those looks and now is doing another ball look for the ball. I think this look is a reference to the All Blacks rugby team and it's very pretty, it's well done, it fits. I like the little mermaid skirt on the bottom. She's got the 69 detail on the back. Who doesn't love a gay making a 69 joke? And I'm totally just teasing because I do the same shit. My Twitter name literally is BussyKing69. And this is also great because this is one of the only hometown looks that totally explained exactly what her hometown is all about. Rugby, period. And as an outside viewer of the show, I think that's super important because you really want to be able to capture the audiences that are all over the world. So we and they have to understand what these queens are doing on the runway. Kitamine did that here and this look is <laughs> Next up, it's Art Simone. At the premiere, Art is 
literally art. She looks like one of those little ballerina top things that you get when you're a kid and you like press it and it spins and like flies away from you. I think the little darker gray tulle puffs are an excellent contrasting detail on this dress, complemented also on that giant cape that she has. I, this is so pretty. This look is absolutely hot. And bitch on the Nude Illusion runway. Now, I don't know if there's something in the international waters that the drag queens are drinking, but remember, we did just see a uh, Mystique runway from Chelsea Boy, which is kind of similar to this. Very different themes, but nonetheless, interesting. And I love that she managed to bring silhouette, shape, and fashion, and give me a story, and give me a fun reference on the Nude Illusion runway. Not many queens did that tonight. This is a Vegemite good look. <laughs> it's and in Melbourne, she uh, fully gagged me again. The way I did not expect this simple little Chanel tweed CEO business bitch look to flip into a painted graffiti art piece, I was shook. Oh, and the hat literally came out of where? Nowhere? She pulled it out of her ass? I don't know. The way it transformed was magical. Whoever made this garment, kudos to you. The only trouble is, as an outsider looking at this runway, and maybe even as somebody from down under, I would have no idea where her hometown is just looking at a graffitied outfit in a business bit look. I think that is maybe the only arguable reason that she didn't get the win this episode because the fashion that she displayed was <laughs> otherworldly. Tim, Tam, thank you, ma'am. This look is And our winner this week is Karen from Finance. Do y'all agree with this or do you think the books were cooked? <laughs> That's an accounting joke if you aren't aware. Anyways, my feelings on this are that I liked Art's runways better overall, but I can understand that Karen's hometown look was a much more clear reference races to a particular place. And in our bottom two this week is Jojo and Electra. This choice also made sense to me. I had no real disagreements here. And of course, y'all know I did do an exclusive lip sync reaction for my patrons, so you can click the link in the description of this video to join my patron family and watch that video and get other exclusive benefits like early access to my videos exclusive videos, access to the Busty Queen Discord server, and more. See you there. And I do want to say in this video, they both killed that lip sync. Electra shook me to my core. I think she out lip synced the top four of RuPaul's Drag Race US in the finale, like gag. As for my hottest on the board naked runway, that goes to etc. etc. I also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest hot and they chose Art Simone. My hottest hot on the no place like home runway goes to Art Simone and my patrons also chose Art Simone. Overall, I'm really excited for this season. I had a lot of fun this episode and yeah, there were a couple little production mishaps, you know, some wonky audio moments and RuPaul, I guess lost her makeup. I don't know what the story was there, but I think excusable for the first episode of a first season that apparently actually was supposed to be filmed in Australia, but had to move to New Zealand because of uh, COVID restrictions or something like that. At least that's the tea that I heard through the grapevine. Make sure to stay tuned throughout this season with me, Bussy Queen, to hear all of the hats and rats. See you next time. Love you. Bye. Hi, ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hats or Rats. And today we'll be reviewing the Snatch Game in the Sea Sickening Runway from Drag Race Down Under. And to make today's analysis a little more exciting, I took the liberty of calculating each queen's Snatch Game Laugh Ratio score, which is a number that I just made up calculated by dividing the number of times a queen makes the judges laugh in the Snatch Game by the total number of responses that they gave. Whether that was when they were responding to a question directly or adding input to someone else's response. And spoiler alert, the Snatch Game was not judged fairly or or at least not aired fairly, but you probably already knew that if you watched the episode. I've just done the math to prove it. And before we get started, I want to let you know that today's episode is going to be completely 100% serious. No jokes, no laughing, and not even a smile will be cracked. Say crack again. <laughs> Sorry, my jokes are dead, canceled. <laughs> They're over. You see, the joy police have spoken. <laughs> and from now on, the channel created by the man in a wig that refers to himself as Buttsy will no longer attempt to be funny. And I'm sorry that I ever tried. <laughs> Just kidding, suck my ass. If I wanna laugh at my own shitty puns, I will laugh at my own shitty puns because if you're not laughing at yourself, how the hell are you gonna laugh at anybody else? Can I get an amen? Now, 
let's get started. First up, going on Drag Race means nothing. You heard it from Art first. In Snatch Game, Art did Bindi Irwin, the late, great Steve Irwin's daughter. Also, fun fact, she won Dancing with the Stars back in 2015. Bindi, not Art. Maybe it's because she's so Bindi. <laughs> In my opinion, Art wasn't funny, but it wasn't necessarily because of her character choice. It was more because she failed to land punchlines in an appropriate amount of time. Snatch Game is all about being quick and she was long-winded. With the exception, of course, that if you can't come up with something funny, you just write a random word on the card and Rue will scream in laughter. In total, they aired three of Art's responses, one of which they laughed at, her intro. Unfortunately, Art's impression got lost in the jungle. It was a but on the runway girl, anything but. She's giving me she weed mermaid realness. She kind of looks like a Grindy wall from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire when they like go into the lake and they're like all attack. You know what I'm talking about. That sea foam green color palette is simply gorgeous. And then like the surprise little scary teeth in the mouth are an excellent touch. The fins on the face. This look is an obvious <laughs> And I have a feeling that for the same reason that Art's looks are so amazing, she flopped in the Snatch Game. She's an over thinker and that can be great when you're planning something, but on the fly, it might not be something that's gonna work out unless you have a lot of practice with it because overthinking and too much thought can be comedy's worst enemy. Next up, Dr. Seuss may have been canceled, but Kit Demain has resurrected him. In the Snatch Game, I thought they gave her kind of an interesting built-in redemption arc. Her intro was completely flat and then everything else they showed after that was funny. She responded a total of three times. The judges laughed two of those three. This was another character like arts bindi with unlimited source material there were so many books and characters that she could have pulled from ultimately i feel kind of played it a little bit safe but i laughed her performance i bought i think it's hot and on the runway one fish two fish redfish blue sea witch fish she's giving me ursula meets glinda the good witch like this is ursula in a different alternate reality where she looks a little more approachable, maybe to your demise. The hair in particular, I think is really cool. It's kind of giving me like she touched Electra shock and then it froze that way. This is another character kind of like Maleficent or something that if you do drag, you probably have at one point or another done this character. And Kit Demain found a way to make her fresh and fun. And for that reason, I think this look is icy. <laughs> Next up, Dingo's Controversy, etc, etc. Etc did Lindy Chamberlain, a woman who was wrongfully convicted of the murder of her small child, who was in fact attacked and taken by a dingo. This person is of course where that common phrase comes from, a dingo ate my baby. And over in America, that is something that honestly, we were so detached from, at least me being a small kid growing up in the 90s, like I heard that phrase, but I, it never meant anything to me. I never even knew that it was like a legitimate real story until recently. So that begs the question, like, was this something that was offensive to the Australian audience? Give me the insight. Give me the tea. I want to know what the down under audience thought about that because the judges were living for it. And, you know, Rue kind of acknowledged it was really, really dark humor. Anyway, she had a perfect laugh ratio. They aired three of her responses and the judges laughed all three times. Mathematically speaking, this performance was <laughs> And on the runway, etc. dove deep. This look is stupid, crazy, and sexy. It is my favorite flavor of drag. Besides, you know, bussy flavored. <laughs> Like I said, I did love this look, but it was almost a little bit too clean. Like with the helmet off, she was almost giving me Carrie as George's dad. Regardless, I still hold my breath for this queen. I think this look was hot. <laughs> Next up, Coco Jumbo did Lizzo in Snatch Game, but was it good as hell? Unfortunately, I think this was kind of a classic case of a queen choosing a pop star that they really love and idolize without thinking about how to actually make them funny. I mean, good God, we have seen it with Gaga, Beyonce, Pink, Whitney Houston, Alicia Keys, and rarely if ever are these successful. Coco is no exception. They aired a total of four of her responses. The judges laughed at one, her intro, which in my opinion really wasn't even that funny. I think the judges did a courtesy laugh for each queen's intro, which is why you'll see that each one does indeed have one laugh from the judges at least. But this is interesting because this is where we start to see clever editing influence and tell the story of what may or may not have happened on this Snatch Game. Make sure to keep listening until the end to hear my post analysis. Anyways, the truth hurts, but her Lizzo was a rat. But what about her runway? This look 
I think had a really good vision. For example, I think the makeup and hair are beautiful, but then I think it kind of ran away from her. This look, it seems to me, is essentially another Ursula, but done in a more classic sense. That's at least the vibe I got from the black dress. But it's kind of like Ursula if she just like grew some legs and left a little bit of seaweed on her arm cuffs. Like I'm not really sure where the rest of the sea element of this outfit was. And then the material of the actual dress looks a little trash baggy to me. I think it's just missing a bit of va va voom, especially compared to what some of the other girls did on the runway tonight. So for that reason, I just wasn't glad to see it. This look is a rat. Next up, she says she needs to wiggle it, but what she really needs to do is issue an apology for her entire cast in the snatch game. Oh my gosh. She killed it. I needed to Queen Elizabeth II, and there was not a second I wasn't laughing. For example, making jokes about corgis and peanut butter on your pieces and parts, and extending your lifespan by wearing a seatbelt. That is exactly where I want to see someone take a character like this. And the editors did her lots of favors. They aired four of her responses, and one time that she jumped in on another queen's response, giving her a total of five responses, of which the judges laughed at all of them. She had a perfect score. And usually in Snatch Games, there's at least one character that gets put in the Snatch game hall of fame if you will and this is definitely the one from this season anita's queen elizabeth ii was barely alive but i was living her performance was <laughs> and on the runway anita is giving us a sexy siren fantasy which if you aren't aware is kind of just another word for mermaid but like the types of mermaids that entrap seamen on their rocks or maybe in their hair like maybe there's something about anita if you know what i'm saying the beading is really fun the coral details are perfect little accessories that let you know this is is indeed a sea witch look and I think it was immaculately done. Did she tell the most interesting story on the runway tonight? Maybe not, but sometimes you don't need to. I think this look was hot. Next up, Maxi Shield, who did Magda Subansky in Snatch Game. And if my research and sources are telling me correctly, she's best known for her performances in Kath and Kim. Major drama. I've had a collapse, she says. Can you come over straight away? And this was one of the only characters where my knowledge level started at zero. The thing is for Snatch Game though, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody isn't going to think your performance is funny. We've seen countless times where Binda Lacrim and Jinx Monsoon, for example, make unknown characters hilarious to all audiences. And I don't think that she really did that. This was a performance I think that maybe tried to rely a little bit too much on the audience's prior knowledge of this character instead of fully developing them right before our eyes. To me, she felt a little bit stiff and awkward. They aired three of her responses, two of which they laughed at, giving her a pretty good Snatch Game laugh ratio, but for me, I still didn't enjoy it. And this one for me is going to be a rat on the runway. Her husband asked where she wanted the pearl necklaces and she said everywhere. Um, okay, this outfit's not my favorite, really. I I'm missing a little bit of a concept. I think obviously she chose pearls because pearls are in oysters, which are in the sea, but this really could have been anything. I don't know, come out as a clam, come out as an oyster and have a pearl inside. Is it the worst thing in the world? No, but there's something about the fit that seems a little bit off and the fabric on the sides back and front below the little bodice area just seemed to kind of randomly be attached. Maxie's pearly whites were pretty, but this look is a rat. Next up, something something Italian pigeons. <laughs> it's Electra Shock. In the Snatch Game, she was doing Catherine O'Hara, of course, as Moira Rose. I'm not sure if the judges really knew uh, who Moira Rose was, though, just kind of based on how they interacted with her. They seemed to completely misunderstand why and what she was saying. But what we heard was at least funny enough, I think because it was so ridiculous. Plus, we got another scream out of her. <laughs> Electra screaming is this season's Dahlia's Broccoli. She had a perfect laugh ratio. They aired three of her responses and the judges laughed all three times. Her performance was hot. But on the runway, did Electra get lost at sea? Firstly, I think Electra looks gorgeous. This is some of the prettiest hair that she's worn in the season so far. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with this look. My only issue is that it doesn't say sea sickening at all all like where is the ocean element besides you wearing seafoam green hair like that's just not gonna cut it for a runway category mama instead of sea sickening she left me sea sick this look was right. next up well hello dolly karen from finance did dolly parton for snatch game no surprise there her promo look was from nine to five jane fonda i did my research i didn't know at first but i looked it up but good golly molly was this dolly right 
Rue was right. Dolly Parton is a huge, larger than life character. In interviews, she's quick as a whip, firecracker. I mean, she's funny as hell. I'm one of 11 kids. Well. Yeah, eight boys, three girls. Wow, you're probably Catholic, right? <laughs> <laughs> we were just horny hillbillies. <laughs> she's just one of those celebrities people don't give enough comedy chop credit to. Um, but Karen didn't do her justice either. Interestingly, they only aired her talking three times, and of those three times, one was her intro, and one was her jumping in on Art Simone's response. Like, she was basically almost not there. And of those three times, the judges laughed only once. This was an editing choice that made me think they were really trying to hide something here. But that's just my two cents. However, on the runway, Miss Karen took a big bite. She's giving us camp, like she always does, like, oh, my Megalodon Trondra. She's giving me the full Glamazon version of one of Katy Perry's backup dancing sharks. <laughs> or maybe she's the shark that bit Katya's leg off and her death becomes her runway. I don't know, but either way, this is fabulous, gorgeous, funny, and pretty. And was maybe one of the best runway interpretations that we saw tonight. This look was a great white Next up, Scarlett Adams has a fat arse, and she likes hot dogs, because she's Jennifer Coolidge, of course. Like, yeah, she did give us two of the big quotes from that character in Legally Blonde, but I wasn't too mad about it. Simple, but effective. Plus, the actual characterization of Jennifer was really well done. The voice, I thought, was particularly funny. But that was all we saw from Scarlett. Those two jokes. Just two. And the judges laughed both times. She had a perfect laugh ratio score. But what were they hiding? It's hard to judge a performance that we really didn't see, but what we saw was good. So I'm gonna have to give this one a <laughs> And on the runway, Scarlett is giving us great barrier quaff. I mean, reef. I enjoy that this wasn't just a really elaborately made pretty bodysuit, because she could have done that, she could have left it there, but she decided to take it a step further. She was like, you know what, I'm going on Drag Race, I gotta amp it up, I'm gonna put on the leg armor, I'm gonna add this huge, giant, dramatic back collar thing behind me that literally is the entire reef, and I'm gonna look sickening in it. She was talking about the Great Barrier Reef dying in her confessional overlaid on top of the runway, which made me actually think, oh, wait, she could have taken this to a little bit of a darker place. Like maybe half of the Great Barrier could have been alive and half dead on her runway. And obviously that's just me using my imagination to try to take an already amazingly beautiful look just one step further. Scarlett gave us reefer and looked smoking. <laughs> now let's get into the nitty gritty of that snatch game. It was not showcased fairly. Drag Race aired anywhere from two to five responses from our queens each. And with that kind of range between responses, I think it can create a really weird effect on how the audience perceives what actually happens during the episode. But this is also not new to Drag Race. If you watch old Snatch Games back, you'll see that the actual amount of responses queens are allowed to give completely vary depending on how they want to tell the story. For example, could the responses from queens like Scarlett and Karen, who only answered one Snatch Game question and gave their intro statement, have hurt them or maybe helped them in this competition? We'll never know. And maybe there's even some justification somewhere in the other responses that Art gave to lift her out of the bottom. In my personal opinion, I would have put Karen instead of Coco or Art in the bottom. I'm not sure which one I would swap out, but Karen's characterization of Dolly, I think was showing a lot less effort than Art's Bindi or even Coco's Lizzo. Regardless though of what happened in the editing room and what they decided to hide and show, they only aired one successful funny response from Coco, Art, and Karen, but showed us more responses from the two queens that did actually end up in the bottom, Coco and Art. In an ideal world, of course, I think we would see all the answers to every single question to make the competition totally fair, but again, it's RuPaul's Drag Race, it's reality TV, and they have a limited time slot for this show. So I don't know if the editing told the story or if the story told the editing. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. But what happened happened, and Anita takes home a well-deserved win, and Coco and Art end up in the bottom with Art sashaying away. Some quick real talk about Art though, I have a feeling that she was just a pawn for a shocking elimination. I mean, I'm not sure if they filmed her exclusive WoW Presents Plus series before or after they filmed Drag Race, but her going home this early just is not sitting right with me. And you know she felt it too with her middle finger up as she walked out 
Salvador. And I did do a lip sync reaction to this available exclusively on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website where my patron family gets exclusive member benefits like early access to my videos, access to exclusive videos, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. Click the link in the description of this video to join my Patreon family today. See you there. Thanks. Overall though, I enjoyed the Snatch Game. I have a really dark sense of humor and Anita did it for me regardless of what anyone else did on the stage. My hottest hot on the runway tonight goes to Art Simone. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot and they've also chosen Art Simone. Thanks for watching and I'll see y'all next time. Love ya. Bye. Pika, 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 Pikachu. Hi, ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing episode three of Drag Race Down Under. The runway category was Bogan Prom. I didn't know what it meant and apparently the contestants didn't either. Well, some of them did. My sources are telling me that Bogan means redneck, but that Australia doesn't have proms, they have formals. So it seems like there was maybe just a miscommunication across the board. Anyways, in the main challenge, our girls were split into groups to perform Queens Down Under. No points for creativity, but at least you won't forget the name of the song. <laughs> Now let's get started, y'all. Okay, this has to come off my hair because that's not gonna work for me. Okay. Our first girl group was named the Outback Fake Hoes. And our first fake ho is Scarlett Adams. It's also worth noting that Scarlett was the leader of this ho brigade. Scarlett had, I think, my favorite performance look of the entire cast tonight. She looks gorgeous, it fit well. It was kind of giving me like denim and diamond vibes, very 80s. It was really fun. Her lyrics in the performance were good, solid. Not super memorable, but they were there. So yeah, this gets a Scarlet Red Hot from me. And on the runway, her Bogan Prom realness is giving me heavy metal and reflective vibes. I had no idea what the hell was going on until she was talking more with the judges and explaining it in her confessional because we do not have the word goon here in America to describe the bag inside of wine boxes. Like I think we just call them wine bags. So while it took me a while to fully understand and get caught up with what was happening, I ultimately loved it. I think she had an amazing concept Concept, it was executed well and it was funny and my god zoom in on those feet she said man feet and the heeled flip-flops on the runway I was like <gasps> but like perfect for this challenge. You know, I mean, disgusting, but genius. She was dressed in silver, but this look was certainly gold. It's hot. Next up, she's very dry, kind of like your vagina. <laughs> okay at least according to her performance verse. That was a wild performance. I bet her and Ketamine give a mean show back at their home bar. The outfit, nah, eh, it was there. It was on her body, whatever, but like she was so funny and entertaining. I don't care what she's wearing. Like the judges said, manic over the top, she was wiggling it and jiggling it. And I was laughing all the way to the bank. And also Rue, gave her a laugh. I think she was the only contestant to get a laugh, at least according to the edit during the performance. I need to put her verse in a hearse. Get it? Cause she killed it. It was hot. On the runway. <laughs> What the hell is going on here? Literally, what is this? I have no idea. I've never seen anything this bizarre on the runway. She's got like pants that are up to her bosom. For what reason? God only knows. Maybe she was going for some sort of like slouchy overall thing because she's got a white tank top underneath and then rhinestoned arm sleeves. I, girl, I was lost from start to finish, but somehow she made it look kind of good. It had her signature quirkiness and I think was a little redneck. At least the can purse and missing tooth and cigarette earrings were. I think I'm gonna give this look a hat. Next up, she would like to speak to the manager of this dance hall. It's etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. She's giving me Karen vibes up top with what looks to be like a deconstructed flamingo dress on the rest of her body. That was one really confusing thing for me in these performances was like none of the girls matched. Not one of them. There was no <laughs> cohesive theme besides like danceable. I was like, girl, we can just tell these girls a theme for this little performance number. No, really, their look was so strange. I didn't even recognize them until I saw them talking in the confessional. Overall, their performance was good. The lyrics were there. Self-branding was present. Non-binary finery from Down Under. I think I will. Et cetera constantly proves that talent knows no binary. This performance was hot. But back at the prom, cash them outside. 
I literally thought that was Bad Baby on the runway. Another look, again, where I was like, where is et cetera, et cetera in this? It was very strange. I'm not totally sure where they incorporated Bogan into this look. Everything that I Googled, I saw nothing like that. And my understanding of what a redneck is here in America definitely does not look like that. I think there's a little too much um, city influence happening in this look for it to be considered redneck by definition. The outfit is cute though. It gave me those like mid 2000s throwback vibes. Like every girl that I knew in junior high owned this exact outfit. But even the girls that dressed like this dressed up for prom. And honestly, I think just throwing on pink sweats with a little rhinestone booty message and some Uggs for the runway, I don't think it's enough. This is gonna be a rat. Next up, another queen gone too soon, Coco Jumbo. In Coco's performance, I honestly was not that mad about the singing, but I'm also tone deaf, so that could have just been me. What did y'all think? Please sound off, let me know what you're thinking in the comments. Cause I was straight up confused by Coco's critiques. Like she was the only queen of purple bedazzled bodysuits. She really did look gorgeous in the performance. The judges were also critiquing her for messing up a couple of times, which I didn't really notice. The, the performances were pretty casual. It slipped right past me, but they also critiqued Anita for the same thing, but sort of like wrote it off as her just being like silly and campy. Kind of a weird choice to do that. But again, maybe that was just my birth defect of not being able to hear different tonations and singing melodies. I thought it was. <laughs> Back at the prom, was she dancing by herself? No, she was out in the bushes with a friend doing extracurricular activities. Again, the judges were smoking something. I don't know, something about these episodes is feeling a little fever dreamish. <laughs> but they got the critiques on Coco all wrong in my opinion. This look I thought was very smart. Campy, tacky, rednecky. I mean, this is that very like cheap, ugly prom dress. And then there's the great details of putting the bush in the hair, the dirt on the knees. She really did think it through. And considering that most of the girls didn't even look like they were on the same runway tonight, I think they, should have understood what she was doing. What's that old saying? A queen in the hand is worth two in the bush? This look is hot. Our next group is called Three and a Half Men and I needed three and a half shots to get through it. First up is Karen from Finance. Her performance look, let's start with the look, really interesting. It looked like one of those tacky oversized t-shirt things with, a, with like the sexy body printed on it, but also was a burlesque costume, wild, but cool. I liked it still, but her verse, eh. I was a little let down here. I didn't laugh. Like it ended and I, I was just like stone cold face. Just like, oh, it happened. Okay, it happened. Like she did the corporate thing. Like her lyrics were all related to like being a person that works in an office, but she just never landed an actual joke from it. It was just as if you asked an actual secretary. <laughs> from our camp queen, I just wanted to have a little chuckle. Just one. This was a rat. And on the runway, tone deaf. Again, every time I thought I knew what Bogan was when I was watching the episode, my mind was blown. I was like, wow, this is Bogan too, okay. Whatever you say. She said she was going for middle of the class 80s Bogan realness with no friends dancing by herself. I didn't get it. Did I see the 80s? Yes. Did I see like redneck? No, I didn't. It was very, I think, too put together. There was nothing trashy about it. Like, I, I need those dirty details from a runway category like this. On top of the fact that, oh my God, this is one of the ugliest effing outfits in the entire world. The ruffles, the print. She looks like, like a sad clown. <laughs> and like ugly, yes. Tacky, yes. Redneck, no, didn't get that. Karen maybe forgot to double check her ledger tonight. This was a rat. However, next up, at least somebody took their K tonight. It's Kitty Mean. Now here she's got a real mean kitty. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Kit had my favorite verse of the entire group, maybe of both groups. I think if her group overall wasn't so bad, they could have justified giving her the win. She was so entertaining. Total perfection, made in a laboratory, grade A, pure quality, Kit and mean, 
And on the runway, she went kid to green. What the hell is this? Literally, these runways had me so confused. Like, every single queen was a different category. The crazy thing is, though, hear this one out. <laughs> Smells like a... If you put her runway with Karen's, they are both very 80s. It's almost as if like 80s tacky prom was given as a category to some queens and then redneck formal to another. I've heard rumors through the grapevine, if you will, that the runway categories are kept intentionally vague when they're given to the queens so that some will succeed and some will fail. That's just a rumor. Anyways, for what it is, it's a really clean look. It's 80s, it's punk, it's fun, retro, crazy. But for Bogan prom, no, it's definitely rat. Next up, Pika Pika, Electra Shock. Okay, let's break down this performance. It was a little erratic compared to her cast members. Sure, I will give the judges that. But at least she was giving us a performance, my God. The rest of the girls were on Ambien, besides Kidda, and she's over there dropping a split every five seconds. Like, can you keep up? No, they, the other girls could not. So while I enjoyed that aspect, I will say the lyrics in her verse were erratic in a bad way. There was no direction. It, she was kind of just jumping all over the place. And then I think she committed the like worst cardinal sin of them all. She called herself basic, then followed that up with basic drag, but I'll make you laugh, representing on RuPaul's behalf. I, you can't call yourself basic on the main stage of RuPaul's Drag Race and then say that you're representing RuPaul. <laughs> You just can't, Rue's not gonna like that. In what world would Rue like that? Anyways, I'm gonna split this one down the middle. Uh, verse, rats. Performance, the dancing, take a shot every time she does the splits. I thought it was hot. <laughs> On the runway, she's giving me Scarlet shock. This was like almost an exact copy of what Scarlet was wearing, but gold. And then the judges went in on this look, just railing her from behind on it, calling it basic, like all this stuff. And I was just like, are we in two separate, completely different worlds? Like, yeah, her makeup you know, could use some finessing, but the drag itself here as presented very much fits the runway category of Bogan Prom. It's just my understanding that trashy, unfinished edges and kind of all over the place with crazy accessories and stuff is what they should have been going for. Was maybe missing a concept more than just doing the category? Sure, but some of the girls didn't even do the category. So like, how are you gonna be mad at it? I think it was hot. And finally, girls, somebody called Life Alert because she has fallen and she can't get up. <laughs> Girl. This was easily my least favorite performance of the night. Like she literally fell on the floor and then spent the rest of the time just like mopping it with her giant buzz. <laughs> And the lyrics were a little confusing. I didn't understand some of what she said and it wasn't really that funny or self-branded either. This for me was a performance worthy of the bottom. I feel like they saved her because they just wanted to like call her a star. And I'm like, okay, well, they're all stars. Well, not yet. I don't know. I just didn't understand the justification of not putting her in the bottom for that. This was a rot, rot, rot. However, on the runway, this granny's fanny was packing a punch. Look at the size of that thing. Oh my God. When the fanny matches the bosom. Her concept here was chaperone at the dance, like partying and wearing her best outfit, which I loved, but was it redneck enough? Uh, I'm not sure. It definitely was kind of tacky and cheap looking, which I think she definitely was going for. And even if her outfit wasn't like the trashiest looking, she sold it to me in the character. Like you could tell she was ready to drink more than the kids at the dance and then like pass out in the bushes next to Coco over there getting it on with her little friend. This chaperone was <laughs> Overall, this group was, I think, an obvious second to the first. Their choreography was really disjointed. And I do think, looking back on everything as a whole, that is actually a pretty decent justification for putting a lecture in the bottom. She was the group leader after all of the second one and responsible for making them look good. And I think that was kind of a flop there. However, the choice here to throw Coco into the bottom instead of Maxi did not make sense, love. The win this episode goes to Scarlett, which makes sense here, considering she led her group to a successful choreographed performance that looked really well done, especially compared to the other groups. And I think she was really the only one tonight to really push that runway category to its limits with comedy, camp, fashion. It, it was really well done. Also, <gasps> who put that note there? 
Has this been here the whole time? <gasps> what is it? Oh my, <gasps> it says watch out. <gasps> if you don't like and subscribe, then RuPaul will bury your body into the fracking branch. Oh my God. You guys better like and subscribe. Oh, and don't forget to check out my lip sync reaction to the bottom two this week over on my Patreon. That's my members only website where my patron family gets access to exclusive videos, early access to my videos, the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. Click the link in the description of this video to join today. See you there. Tonight, my hottest on the runway goes to Scarlett Adams. I also ask my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and tonight they've chosen Electra Shock. See y'all later. Love ya. Bye. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. Today we're going to be reviewing episode four of Drag Race Down Under. And for the main challenge and runway this episode, our queens had to recycle trash into fashionable runway ready garments. We also saw Art Simone get recycled into the competition. But why? I'll be discussing Art's returns, going over everyone's looks, and also analyzing a new little subplot that the producers are trying to sell us at the end of the video. Now, let's get started. First up, let's talk about Art, baby. Honestly, I was shocked to see her come out of the dumpster and to not also be accompanied by the other two queens that have been eliminated in this competition so far. Don't get me wrong at all. I'm thrilled to have Art back in the competition. I think she deserves this spot, but it just felt like a big missed opportunity opportunity on the show's production side not to give everyone else a fair chance. I think the get out of jail free card that they essentially handed Art is honestly just a blatant sign of overproduction this season, especially because we found out that it was Art who left the little like watch out note on the mirror. Like that just made this whole thing feel so obviously planned from the get go. The shocking elimination of the queen that everybody expects to do well in the competition happens to leave a note that says watch out and then is brought back two episodes later. I'm just like, girl, are we even trying to hide the writing and storyline production anymore at this point? Or <laughs> we're just blatantly acknowledging that nothing about this is even a competition, it's just reality TV. Okay. And I don't know what all the queens really thought, but Coco tweeted this. Give the white girl another go. She deserves it. Hashtag drag race down under. Let me know what y'all thought about this choice to bring art back down in the comments below. And while you do that, I'll talk a little bit about her outfit. My first thought when she hit the runway was, Marie Antoinette on drag race? Groundbreaking. <laughs> okay, just kidding. But like, we have seen this done a million times before. Raja, Max, Detox, Jinx, Robbie Turner, Miss Cracker, Jimbo, to name a few. Hell, we've already even seen a Marie Antoinette interpretation on this season of Drag Race from JoJo in episode one. I will say, this look was very pretty. In particular, I loved the sparkly hair, the giant headpiece. It was very camp, very drag, and very art. It was pretty. If I could improve just one small thing about it, I maybe would have added some glitter or rhinestones to the tights just to match the glittery sparkly explosion that she had going on from like the chest up. But like you can't say this isn't one of the best constructed looks on the runway tonight. This look is a Marie Antoine hat. And yes, that pun was recycled. Next up, are you kidda me? <laughs> Bitch, are you kidding me? This look is, to be gentle about it, revolting. <laughs> It is absolutely abhorrent through the lens of fashion. It is terrible, but I kind of hate it so much that it makes me take a second look at it and I realize, okay, it is really well constructed. There's a cohesive theme. She's got a great silhouette going on, like teeny tiny little waist. And she even has like a little tool petticoat underneath the skirt that she's constructed. Again, very well done. It just isn't gonna be everyone's, you know, preferred cup of tea. I think because it is so traditionally camp and very far removed moved from the fashion world. And I think it's so funny to see people's different takes and uses of unconventional materials. Utica's use of a sleeping bag, for example, on her design challenge and actually ball pit balls that she had on some of her runways versus like what Ketamine chooses to do with those same things. Anyways, this look is 100% pure, camp, tacky, unadulterated stupidity. And I think it's hot. Next up, they may have flown too close to the sun tonight. It's et cetera, et cetera. They were going for this sort of 20s sun goddess reference, which I think was partially achieved. Definitely in their own flavor, I would say. Also, this is one of the looks I think on the runway that makes you forget that they did indeed construct their looks out of 
trash. Especially with the really pretty details that they have included on this look with those little like crystals hanging off at different points. But I can also see what the judges were saying. It maybe didn't pack as much of a punch as some of the other looks on the runway, but by no stretch of the imagination was this look bad at all. Etc. may have ended up at more of like cloud goddess, but I still like it and think this look is hot. Next up, is it fashion? It's Maxi Shield. So fresh off the back of Drag Race UK season two, where Vivian Westwood was a common topic of discussion with queens like Ahura, I immediately recognized this reference. Like for her to, as the judges said, really hit that reference spot on, that you know immediately what she's doing when she hits the runway, but also in her own unique original flavor, I think was a huge success tonight. She even made a purse out of the same material. I love the little spray paint details on the back. Maxi killed it. Fashionably speaking, I think Maxi's may be the best on the runway tonight. If I could change just one small thing, I may have added a small little fascinator out of that same material just right atop her head, which also would have been very in line with classic Vivian Westwood references. Tonight, Maxi proves she's no Maxinista. She's a fully fledged fashion queen. I think this look is hot. Next up, I'd like to speak to the manager, please. <laughs> We need a refund. Karen, what is this? My biggest issue with this look overall is that so little of it was actually transformed from the trash that it started as. The lay, the neck pillow, the wakeboard, just sitting in a backpack on her back. All in an, I guess, excuse to try to pass this off as some sort of character inspired runway of Chappelle Corby. Like I'm convinced that that was really just some sort of elaborate distraction. She was trying to spin for Rue to basically pass off that she didn't have the same sewing and outfit construction abilities that maybe some of the other queens had. So many of our other queens tonight that we've seen are telling stories. They have full references and this is a pillowcase tucked into a towel wrapped around her waist. Karen was carrying a joint on the runway, but this look deserves time in the joint. It's a rat. Next up, Electra. Shocked? Yes, I was. In my notes while I was watching the episode, I just wrote, wow. Electra turned the corner, I thought it was scarlet. That was how good the makeup, hair, and overall look got overnight. And once I realized it was Electra, I was like, hold up, wait a minute. Did she just pull shark us? Because how does somebody pull a 180 that dramatic? from one episode to the next. Anyways, couldn't have been more proud of Electra tonight. She did what I think is most important in a design challenge, taking those original materials and transforming them to a point where you don't even really recognize what the original material once was. In her case, it was ties that a man would wear in a business suit, which funnily, the whole concept of her outfit would have been great for like Karen from Finance's character, <laughs> but here it is on Electra. Anyways, I loved it. Electra, shock me and tie me up. This look was hot. Next up, you won't want to put her down. It's Anita Wiglet. On my first watch through, I was genuinely surprised with how well Anita pulled through on this challenge. I didn't expect a fully told like book burning story, which is super important in our era of like Big Brother and fears of censorship, etc., etc. But the judges didn't see what I saw. They were basically saying like, oh, this is an original. We've seen this before. And I'm like, what the hell are they even talking about? The book ball in season eight, where they asked them to make looks out of books or maybe Ivy Winter's paper dress. But then again, like none of those looks looked anything like this. And so on top of them being off base about the look being unoriginal, it's also not fair to give that critique to her when they didn't give that same critique to Art, which would have been actually more valid to give to her. A small valid critique I will say that the judges gave Anita maybe was that the bottom part of the dress did kind of just turn into book pages fully just glued on, but I wasn't mad about it because as they came up the dress, they got more burned and more burned. Anyway, I don't know what those judges are smoking, but I think I need a refund on my WoW Presents Plus subscription, mama. This look is hot, literally. Next up, speaking of recycled looks, it's Scarlett Adams. This look is really clean. It's very pretty, but I feel like we just saw this on Utica and Miss Cracker. And I'm not bringing up those comparisons to be shady towards Scarlett, 
only to bring them up as a point of discussion around this concept of like originality on the runway. Girl, we're what, 13 seasons and like four, five, six international seasons deep. We're gonna have some reused references. So I think this is really just a great way to point out that the judges will sometimes just say totally random things that make no sense to drive storylines and plots that serve no other point than to tell a predetermined story of what will happen on a season of Drag Race. But yeah, the flower fascinator, the little grapes all over the look, the little lace details on the hems of the outfit, all very pretty, dainty, really great look, Scarlett. This look is a total snack. It's hot. <laughs> that's it for the runway looks, but that's not all the fish that we have to fry tonight in terms of in addition to Art's return, we are also seeing this storyline between Scarlet and Elektra develop even further. Last episode, we saw these two lead the two teams. Of course, Scarlet won and Elektra ended up in the bottom. And in this episode, we see Rue come into the workroom and push Scarlet to give advice to Elektra in front of like all of the queens in the workroom. Cue drama. And look, if I know anything about this show, it's that everything happens for a reason. I have no doubt that we are going to see these two in a lip sync smackdown in the coming few episodes, maybe before like we hit final three or four, but that's just my prediction. Let me know what you are thinking. In our bottom two this week is Karen from Finance and Anita Wiglet. This was tough for me. Karen absolutely deserved the bottom. I think they could have just sent her home for what she put on the runway alone. But you know, you gotta have someone else in the bottom. Should it have been Anita? Should it have been etc.? Should it have been Ketamine? I don't know, maybe one of those three. I think it really was just crazy to see the obvious lack of effort on Karen's side versus the large amount of effort that I think every other queen put into this design challenge because there were so many great looks on the runway tonight. And I did do a reaction to this lip sync, which is available exclusively on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website where my patrons get exclusive benefits like early access to my videos, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, exclusive videos, access to vote in hottest top polls, and more. Click the link in the description of my video to join my patron family today. We do see Anita Wiglet sashay away, which didn't feel too right, and then they give the win to Scarlet, which, while justifiable, I think didn't sit right with me either. I really wanted to see them reward Maxi or Electra for like really going out on a limb and amping up what they've been doing in the competition. I just don't see the point in like solidifying somebody win status so early in the competition. Again, this maybe was just another little point to further develop that Scarlet and Electra storyline. I guess only time will tell. My hottest hat on the runway tonight goes to... Electra Shock. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and tonight they've chosen Maxi Shield. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys later. Love ya. Bye. Bye, ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rot. And today we're going to be reviewing the most controversial episode of Drag Race Down Under yet, and maybe the most controversial of the entire franchise. Our queens were challenged to create and market their very own brand of yeast bread, like Vegemite, and the runway category was Finest Sheila in the Bush. In addition to breaking those down, we'll also be discussing Scarlett Adams' admission of past cultural appropriation and use of blackface in performances, taking a look at Art Simone's and Karen from Finance's past controversies that have resurfaced online, and then finally looking at how some of of our queens responded to this episode. Also, as you can probably hear, I'm suffering from a bit of a cold, so please excuse my nasaliness today, and just know that Bussy Queen will be back. First up, serving Edgar Allan Poe on the runway. It's Electra Shock. She says her runway is inspired by the Huya bird, which is a now extinct species once native to New Zealand. This look is chic, gender bent, and I think most importantly, makes you ask questions. She has all the hallmarks of what is an amazing runway here. I think she did a great job of giving the judges and us as viewers something that we weren't expecting, as well as doing something that was a great homage to her home country. And you know what they say, a Huya bird in the hand is worth Two hooey birds in the bush. Quat the raven, this look is high. 
Perfect. Her success continued in the main challenge. Her spread is called Topped by Busted Spreads, which is a spread containing charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent to get her to the top of the competition. It was a really meta take on this challenge that allowed her to both make fun of herself and also manifest her way into the top placement this week. She also did a great job of being absolutely filthy, but taking precaution to, you know, disguise her jokes in a TV friendly way, as Michelle would say. I definitely think that subtleness is what allowed her to succeed. This was an obvious hot. Next up, she's finally left her chrysalis and wow, she looks amazing. It's Kitamine. Her runway is a butterfly extravaganza and no butterflies were harmed in the making of this look. I hope. The back collar piece behind her head is my favorite part. It kind of reminds me of that headpiece that Shangela wore in her Mariah Carey lip sync thing that she did, which reminds me of the time that Scarlet Envy thought that Mariah Carey's fans were called butterflies and not lambs. And of course also of Jasmine Master's cocoon look and, well, need I say it, Asia O'Hara's butterfly disaster in the finale. <laughs> Butterflies have had an interesting history on RuPaul's Drag Race, but that's for another video. Anyways, I really can't give enough praise to this look. I think the glitter eyebrows and lips are amazing. She looks pretty and the dress itself is just really well made. The butterflies are patterned and glued in such a way that it really like cinches in her waist and gives her a great silhouette. A true metamorphosis, this look is her ad was for a yeast spread called Yeasty Nuts. Firstly, I love that she used a divine reference in the second part of her ad. It reminded me that the TikTok crowd has been learning who divine is recently. <laughs> Everyone now, condone first degree murder. Advocate cannibalism. Eat shit. Filth are my politics. Filth is my life. Gotta educate the children somehow, right? However, I'm not sure how she got to Divine from the beginning of her ad because initially she was like, oh, this is for all my donut filling lovers looking for new fillings for their donut holes. You know, I think kind of making a joke about holes getting filled. But then the divine thing was a reference to divine eating dog poo. And I'm just not totally sure how those two things connected, but it was still funny. I think mostly because she was just like shoving it up her nose and in her mouth and making a complete fool of herself. So she was successful at least in that realm, even if the ad was a little unclear. This ad was a mess, yes, but it also was a hot mess. Next up, she's taking us back to the year 1900. It's Maxi Shield. She says her runway is a movie from 1975 that tells the story of a school teacher and her classroom going to have a picnic at Hanging Rock in the year 1900. They disappear and they're never heard from again. The interesting element of all of this is that no one knows if this was a real event or purely fictional. And yes, I did just learn all of that from Wikipedia. <laughs> I do love a good reference, especially when they teach me something new. So for that, I want to give Maxi a hat. However, I have to say that when references are done on the runway for RuPaul's Drag Race, I think the queens have to be really careful that they don't come off as costumey. And ultimately, I think this one kind of does. It just wasn't elevated enough. Like it looks like she plucked this directly from the movie instead of transforming it into something for Maxi. For example, let's take a look at Utica's curtain look from Carol Burnett's Went With The Wind comedy scene. Sketch. It's transformative and makes the reference without being an exact copy of the thing she's referencing. I think there was plenty of room here for Maxi to transform this, and because she didn't, I'm going to give this a fact. Her spread was called Hornbag Yeast Concentrate, which according to the ad was designed to, well, turn you into a hornbag and get you a man. I think I need some of that. I do agree with the judges here that there was definitely room in the ad for her to be funnier. She kind of just sat in the chair and didn't do much else but she did something a lot of the other girls didn't. She sold a product with a clear purpose. I knew exactly what it was for. So while it wasn't as slappy or knee funny as Kita's or Electra's, at least it made sense. So for that reason, I'm gonna leave this one at a warming up. Next up, she does day shifts at the office and night shifts on the fireman's pole. She says she's serving Coco Chanel does the Country Fire Association. Look, I think the message behind this runway is beautiful, but it is ugly as sin. I'm so sorry. I'm not buying that Chanel would put something like this on a runway. The material used to construct it doesn't read well, maybe it's the color, and the fit overall just seems way too baggy on her body. And the plastic bedazzled fireman's hat doesn't do a lot to elevate this look either. In general, this style is very much in the essence of Karen from Binance, but she normally has a way of kind of modernizing some of the cuts and styles that she pulls from, and I 
don't think that was done properly for this specific look. So for me tonight, this look is a rat. In her ad, she was selling a yeast spread called Discharge. Mm-hmm. Discharge. The judges acted like this was really funny. Personally, I didn't laugh. It felt really, really flat to me. It was like the only joke there was her saying the word discharge over and over just to be unsettling. I think her ad failed to achieve even the bare minimum of what a marketing commercial should do, and that is to tell the viewer why they want to buy something. She gave no real use cases for her yeast spread or what would make somebody want it. For me, this ad deserves a discharge from the competition. It's a Overall, I think there's something really interesting happening with Karen in this competition. I believe she's an extremely talented queen, but with all due respect, she failed to deliver in the last recycled challenge, wasn't funny in Snatch Game, her lyrics fell flat in the performance verse that they wrote, and now this. It just seems that no matter what Karen does, they are hellbent on pushing her to the top of the competition. I think it's also really interesting they chose to bring up Scarlett's blackface and cultural appropriation in her past, yet failed to mention Karen's, and then criticized, etc etc for being too on the nose while Karen just sold a product called Discharge. Favoritism on Drag Race? I never. More on those topics later though. Next up, we have a two in one special. It's Art Simone. The first part of her look is this super chic coat and cork hat, which is a traditional part of Australian garb, apparently used to keep insects away. Like the swinging corks would basically keep the flies from buzzing around your face. She takes all that off and reveals to a cafe night illusion, which I thought was a Wonderful reference. Remember, we just saw her done by Tace in the UK Series 2 Snatch Game. She's giving me camp, fashion, and reveals all wrapped into one runway, which is amazing, and fully transformed her references to put her art stamp on them. Run this look up my flagpole. It's hot. However, her spread left me feeling a bit yanked. It's called Art's Yeasty Yank Extract. And by the way, yank is a pejorative term used for Americans in Australia, which is great. I don't really care if people are making fun of Americans at all. I think that's lovely. However, I watched the ad and in my notes, I literally just wrote, what the hell happened? Like, she looks great in it, but it took me a few watches to realize that the yeast was literally supposed to extract Yanks, aka Americans, from being, I guess, in close proximity of... Australians? Like she gave the example of the annoying tourist in the beginning and then spent I think way too long in the kitchen telling us about how to make it which was mostly bleeped out and then there was just no payoff at the end of the ad like how do you use it? Do you eat it? Rub it on yourself? Spray it at people? Do you boof it? I don't know. She didn't tell us. The judges seemed to like it but Reese did bring up that it was overall confusing and he was unsure about what happened which I'm not sure if you guys have noticed but I feel like there is often a lot of disagreement between Reese and Rue and Michelle but they kind of like hide it or just like flash right over it? I don't know. Anyways, I'm yanking this product off the shelf. It's a rat. Next out of the bush is etc. etc. On the runway, etc. is wearing a beautiful eucalyptus tree coat with red hair and gloves symbolizing the red flowers that are found on the tree. It reveals to a burnt tree stump and then out of her chest, she pulls out new life. She literally told like the circle of life story on this runway. It's amazing. And then the only real critique we see on this look is that the guest judge was like, I wish you kept your coat on longer. I was like, y'all can't appreciate the high fashion camp drag happening here. <laughs> so sad because this look is red, as for her yeast, it's for a spread starting with the letter P. Can't say that full word on YouTube or that is demonetization central. The judges acted like they hated it, but hear me out because I think it was actually one of the best ads. Firstly, she gave us clear reasons to buy her product. It's a neurotoxin and an oven cleaner. <laughs> She had clever jokes that were plays on common words like P, it's number one, not number two. Plus she had side gags. It was ridiculous and fun. Instead of recognizing how clever the ad was, Rue said it was too on the nose and Michelle said there are some lines we don't cross on television. I was like, um, hello, are we watching the same show? Y'all were totally fine with Karen doing discharge this, discharge that, but the second we're talking about P, that's too far? And this is crossing a line on the same show that RuPaul makes fisting jokes on every other episode? Like, are we living in the same reality? Cause I don't think we are. To the judges, I say pee off. This ad was hot. 
And finally, the queen of controversy today, Scarlett Adams. Her runway look is inspired by this iconic scene from Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, where she's on top of the bus and this beautiful gown is flowing behind them. By the way, if you're watching Drag Race and haven't seen this and other classics like Tu Wong Fu and Paris is Burning, well, why, what are you doing? Pause this and go watch them and then come back. I have no complaints about the garment that Scarlett is wearing tonight. It's as hot as the desert itself. However, her ad, I think, deserves a little more scrutiny. It's for a yeast spread called Snatch, which is designed to, well, snatch your snatch. I will say, technically speaking, the ad was well done. She had a product that had a clear use case and told us why, as consumers, we would want to buy it and how it's going to help us. And she wrote plenty of jokes for the ad. However, we are in 2021, and her entire skit relied on making fun of a body part that she does not have. Like, it kind of just felt like a really cringy attack on that specific woman's body part. And I think as drag performers that are cis men dressing up as women, we have a duty to make sure that our drag is not making fun of women, but instead celebrating them. So as this ad was executed, it was not in good taste at all. Frankly, it was kind of offensive. And the thing is, she could have done this entire ad from the perspective of tucking the body part that she does have and making fun of that body part. That would have been, I think, totally acceptable. And I do think that it was obviously way more over the line than et cetera's. Like, I feel similarly to this one and how it sort of relied on making fun of a female body part as I do about Karen's. They both just kind of we're in bad taste. A rat indeed. Now let's get into the controversy. The drama. But in all seriousness, I do want to give you a little content warning. The rest of the video is serious in nature and covers sensitive topics. In the workroom of today's episode, the queens are discussing their regrets and Scarlett brings up her past of doing blackface and incorporating cultural appropriation into her performances. The discussion gets a little heated and etc. brings up the importance of making sure that apologies have actions that show those apologies are serious. The next time we hear about it is on the runway. After the critiques, RuPaul is just kind of out of nowhere like, Scarlett, it's come to my attention that there are photos of you online performing in blackface, as if she had literally just received a message in her ear from the producers that they found it in that moment. Rue then gives Scarlett a chance to apologize for her past, which she does, and RuPaul forgives her, saying, I'm sure there are people that would want me to cancel you, but I'd rather this be a lesson in humility and accountability. And then that's all we hear about it for the rest of the episode. It felt rushed and weird and unfinished. After the episode, though, is when things started getting a little crazy online. Scarlett posted a link to an apology video on her Instagram. It starts off with Scarlett elaborating about what had happened, saying this. There are a lot of things from my past that I am not proud of. Things I did, a geisha makeup, wearing Native American headdresses, cultural appropriation, performances which ridiculed accents, and um, blackface. She further elaborates, saying this. For these things, I am deeply ashamed. I'm embarrassed, and I can not apologize enough for the hurt that was caused from those acts. And then later includes information in the video about what she's done to atone for her actions. Uh, I was the first person at the court hotel to start doing the acknowledgement of country. I also uh, learnt Auslan, which is Australian Sign Language, so that I could include deaf people in on uh, the acknowledgement of country. I created a document that all performers who came to the court had to sign, which said that performances that include cultural appropriation would not be tolerated. In producing Friday night production shows at the Court Hotel, I made sure to include POC or trans artists. Eight out of the nine shows that I ever produced there featured either a POC artist or a trans artist or often both. I created a digital drag show with all of the proceeds from that going towards um, Black Lives Matter. The money that I made from my past problematic performances I've donated and I continue to donate to pay the rent every month. I've had lots of in person conversations with people of First Nation communities, as well as local BIPOC performers. And I have participated in Zoom calls around Australia with leaders in BIPOC. When Scarlett's past was originally resurfacing online, so was Karen from Finances. It was discovered that she once had a collection of Gollywog dolls and a tattoo of one of those dolls like on her leg somewhere. She released an official apology on Instagram saying this, I would like to formally apologize for a part of my past.
past, something that I've long been remorseful for and admittedly ashamed to share. 11 years ago, I had a collection of Gollywog dolls, a collection that began when I was two, and I made the decision to have one of those dolls tattooed. I can't change the past, but I can, and will work on the present and do better in the future. Additionally, after this episode aired, Art Simone was accused of doing blackface and incorporating cultural appropriation into her performances. She immediately jumped onto Twitter to address these accusations, saying this. Just wanted to jump on here and acknowledge that there are images starting to circulate. They are of an old show poster for a show called Suntan. There are also old images of me wearing a kimono and headpiece. For years, Australian drag has ridden the line between cultural appropriation and appreciation. I learned that my appreciation could be seen as appropriation. I learned and grew and I stopped wearing that costume. I am forever learning and growing and doing my best to be a figurehead for my community. I'm so grateful to the people I have around me for their different eyes and experiences in the world. She also shared the original unphotoshopped version of herself in the suntan poster where you can see that her skin was of natural color. So this is pretty heavy stuff and there really is no textbook written about how to deal with situations like this, but I can say that sending and spreading hate online isn't uh, the best way to deal with any of this. I think this is really a time to look towards the BIPOC community and seeing what they're saying and seeing how we can help according to those people that have been marginalized. So because of lack of experience, I can't really speak on racism in Australia, but I can say that as an American, we have a very deep history of racism and blackface and cultural appropriation being perpetuated and normalized by the media at large. The past, in a lot of cases, is not pretty, but it can be learned from. Personally, I always look to evaluate someone's character based on who they are today and what they're doing now instead of who they maybe once were. I think it's better to have a society that allows people to grow and change instead of continually punishing them for all eternity. So with all that said, I do have a little conspiracy theory related to this episode, if you're with me. Basically, my theory is that the producers used Scarlet as a pawn and attempt to get positive ratings i.e. they were looking for that Emmy moment. Firstly, we know that conversations in the workroom are prompted by the producers. And all of this happened on an episode that aired on May 29th, which is in the middle of Australia's annual Reconciliation Week, occurring every year from May 27th to June 3rd, which, by the way, is a national celebration, quote, building on the respectful relationships shared by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other Australians. Basically, it's a time to acknowledge the mistreatment of Indigenous peoples by white people in Australia. And we also know that Scarlet's runway referenced Priscilla Queen of the Desert. In that movie, the tour bus breaks down, which leads to a scene where the queens and a group of indigenous people have a little heartfelt moment relating to one another, and it's really a beautiful moment between two groups of marginalized people. But I don't think the Priscilla reference was a coincidence considering the topics discussed during the episode, the focus on Scarlet, and the air date. And the editing, as we saw, tells the rest of the story. We didn't get a resolution between Scarlet and the other queens. The queen that was most critical on her, etc., was sent home, and Art Simone in a now deleted tweet said, I wonder why they cut out Untucked, seemingly hinting that there was indeed more to the story. But by cutting that out, the show contained the narrative of reconciliation and wrapped it in a nice little bow with RuPaul being the arbiter of truth in this moment. I also want to point out that the overall theme of reconciliation felt soured by the two contestants that were indigenous peoples of color to Australia were already eliminated and in the past episode, Art was brought back without also extending the same opportunities for those two people to also return to the competition. Like, it just felt wrong that the people who were marginalized by performances like Scarlet did in the past were not in the room during all of this to help facilitate conversation. At bare minimum, they could have brought Coco and Jojo back into Untucked or something and had a moment in there where they really discussed things on a deeper level. Anyways, let me know what you think. Was this all a coincidence or was it planned? Our well-deserved winner this week is Electra Shock. And our bottom two are Etc. and Maxi. Personally, I definitely would have put Karen in the bottom this week. And then the other spot, I think you could argue between Maxi, Karen, Scarlet, and Art. And I did do a lip sync reaction to this, available exclusively on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. Click the link in the description to join today and get exclusive member benefits like early access to my videos, exclusive videos, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. Our episode wraps up with Etc. wrongly going home. This bitch was robbed. My hottest this week goes to etc etc. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and this week they've chosen Electra Shock. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see y'all next time. Love ya. Bye.
it's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. Oh, 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 it feels good to be back. Today, we'll be ranking the Drag Race Down Under talent show performances and reviewing the How's Your Head piece runway looks. By the way, for all my Gen Z babies, the How's Your Head recurring joke on Drag Race is actually a reference to Elvira herself. Oh my gosh, Elvira, I'm sorry. Are you all right? Yeah, I think so. How's your head? Well, I haven't had any complaints yet. Excuse me? What's that, you ask? How's my head? Horny and guaranteed to make you finish. It's gonna be a bumpy ride today, so make sure to fasten your seatbelts and make sure to stay tuned until the end of today's video if you wanna see my special talent. Now, let's get started. First up, it's Karen from Finance. Her talent today was balloon animal. Period. <laughs> The producers, I think, were trying their hardest to give Karen a storyline this episode and landed on the stepping outside of your box one. And by that, I mean that in the workroom today, RuPaul asked Karen to sex it up a little bit. And our Drag Race veterans will know this is nothing new. Ru is always asking queens to do things that they don't normally do, which is great. But I'm not really buying that Karen challenged herself or stepped outside of any kind of box. I think she just wore the outfit she was originally planning on wearing in the first place. And her character already kind of of plays with that sex element. Anyway, so Karen hits the stage, appearing to take Rue's advice and nipple tassels in a harness. <gasps> and walks around the stage for about 30 seconds and then finally makes a singular balloon animal. Three, four, or five might have been impressive, but just one? Overall, I thought this was really lackluster. Michelle said it best. That's it. Karen's talent show was full of rot air tonight. On the runway though, I was like, who in the Cindy Lou Who is this? Oh my God, this was amazing. A gag a Trondra, a full gag, if you will. Maybe even a gag's bound and chained. <gasps> I love this. This is that crazy campy character that Karen from Finance is at her best. And this is also what I was talking about though with her character already kind of playing with sexy elements in her drag. She often has those little svelte body cutouts. She kind of already toes that line. Oh, the places you'll go if you're the producer's favorite. This look was hot. <laughs> Next up, she's getting stuffed. And I I'm jealous. It's Art Simone. Her talent was eating. Basically, <laughs> basically she walks up to a table with three plates of food. The first one she eats, the second one she throws on the floor, and the third one, <gasps> it's empty. Whatever will she do? Of course, she put her fist in her mouth. Fisting is a talent indeed. Not everyone has the wherewithal or gape to accomplish such a feat. Okay, on a real note, Art, I love you to death. I really do, but what the hell was this? Like, I was sitting there waiting for a punchline, but it just never hit me. Maybe there was some sort of deep social commentary about capitalism and eating the rich, or maybe not. Saying it out loud like that really makes me think maybe not. As it was, it was my second least favorite of the night. It was a rat. But good God on the runway. And I'm gonna be saying that a lot tonight because this was maybe the best runway of maybe all the international franchises, a lot of the US seasons. Head pieces off to you gals. It was <laughs> amazing. And arts specifically was killer. Not like in the Asia O'Hara sense, but like in the metaphorical sense. She says that she's giving us gum nut baby realness. And I was like, what the hell is that? So I went on over to a little YouTube channel called The Rory Show. He does these little reference recaps for runways, which are amazing. He taught me about the gum nut baby children's books, which I guess are really popular down under. They're about these, well, gum nut babies. Literal personified gum nut babies of the eucalyptus tree. <laughs> named Snuggle Pot and Cuddle Pie, which I absolutely hate. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Roy, for the reference check. Back to Art's runway, I think what really made it special was the attention to detail here, the tattered edges, the sheerness, the cage skirt, and of course, the apparently cat toys that she used to construct the headpiece. Art can turn a look. She has yet to fail to live up to that name. This look was hot. Next up, Abra Katabra Mina Kazam. Kitamine's talent was magic. And here I was thinking the only witches were in London and Waverly Place. I was living for Michelle's reaction shots to the beginning of this performance. I felt the same way. It took a while to warm up, okay? That's not a secret, but I think she really came through at the end. She had like three different outfit reveals, which happened by magic. I don't know what she was doing, but I was impressed. And the funny thing was, 
So were the judges. I think Rue even gave it a wow, despite hating magic. And then the critiques came around on the runway and they were like, the outfits look cheap, the fabric was bad, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, wait a second, what's happening here? Like it's a campy magic drag show done by a man in a wig, not New York Fashion Week. So why are we all of a sudden focusing on these arbitrary details? Probably for storyline, which we'll get to here in a second. Anyways, I thought the talent was hot. In fact, it was my second favorite of the night. And on the runway, the slayage continues. She was giving me cyberpunk raver girl Barbarella Fembot realness. It pulled in so many amazing references and looked stunning on the runway. Plus, she gave us a light show with the hair. I think Kidamine is one of the most consistently impressive queens in this competition. She's always got something up her sleeve or in her moon boots. This look was hot. Kidamine ate this episode up, but the judges still put her in the bottom. Here's my little conspiracy theory. So the producers have been driving this Electra versus Scarlet storyline for the past three or four episodes. They were probably dying to have them lip sync against each other, but Scarlet did way too well in this episode for that to happen. And I think the producers realized it was gonna be now or never. And turns out it was never. So they went for the emotional sister versus sister lip sync angle instead. As with a lot of this season though, the storytelling has not been focused on the right things. So there was no payoff and it didn't even make sense that it happened. Anyways, next up. She likes the pole and the hole. Same. Any Jerry Blank fans in the audience? Let me know down in the comments. It's Scarlett Adams. This maybe was one of the most difficult talents that was displayed tonight. The amount of body strength and coordination that what she did requires is incredible. And there's no denying that Scarlett did amazingly. But I am gonna call her out real quick in the confessional. She made a comment that was like, queens don't really do pole. And I'm like, wait a second. Are we forgetting that Shea Coulee literally just did a pole dancing talent show number in All Stars 5? And I'm not saying Scarlett can't also do that talent, but I am just saying like, let's not forget about it. But yeah, you're probably questioning your sexuality after watching this and that's okay. This performance was hot and my favorite of the night. And on the runway, whoa, whoa. Wow! Wow! That was my impression of Tamisha Iman doing share. I have almost no words for this. This. <gasps> Literally, I was watching this. And I was just like, wow, wow, wow. This is one of the most beautiful garments to ever grace the RuPaul's Drag Race stage. I'm not sure if she stole this from Cher's closet or threw some pearls on the stage of Vegas and robbed it from an actual showgirl, but it is amazing. And you know what they say, the devil's in the details. This look was hot. And finally, now you see ya, now you don't. Get it? Because she was eliminated. It's Electra Shock. Electra's talent was interpretive dance, but her wig needed no translator. It was screaming for help. <laughs> Okay, on a real note, this was probably the second most physically and mentally demanding of all the talents displayed. Choreographed interpretive dance. That's a skill that not many people have. And I also think it's one that's kind of hard to appreciate if you aren't familiar with it. And I'm not, I'm uncultured swine, but I still kind of liked it. I think one of the biggest issues with this though is RuPaul and Michelle are always looking for two things and comedy. If you can put them together, great. But typically they want you to have one or the other. Electra had neither tonight. And I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm just saying that's what the show typically looks for. The crazy thing though, is that when they're giving critiques, Michelle tells Electra she hopes that Sia sees this performance and casts her for a video. I literally could not think of higher praise to give somebody for this type of talent show thing. I hear that and I'm thinking, okay, cool. They're gonna like definitely put her in the top this week. And then they go in for the roadkill on top of her head. <laughs> I do think wearing the wig was a mistake, but I don't think it was one that should have put her in the bottom. Again, was this a talent show or a fashion show? It just seriously blows my mind that they could give more reward to a singular balloon animal than an entire choreographed dance. Even if her wig was thirstier than Jockstrap's twink at Pride. Her talent was lost in translation to the judges, but I thought it was and my third favorite of the evening. On the runway, she swings and she scores again. She's giving me Moulin Rouge, Chicago, Broadway, New York, jazz hands. I'm living for the camp factor of her putting a literal swing 
on her headpiece that touches on her booty. It's so great. And I think one of the reasons I love Electra so much is that she reminds me of the older days of Drag Race when it seemed like they would cast more like Diamonds in the Rough than Hollywood Ready Starlets. Anyways, yes, this look is packed. Now, let's spill some quick tea. Rue asked everyone who should go home tonight. Everybody, of course, says Electra. And I don't know if the regular viewer of Drag Race knows this, but drag is highly political. And I'm not talking about racial tensions. There's a whole culture of paying dues, respecting elders, etc., etc. And often, like, you kind of have to rub elbows and shake hands with the right people if you want to get cast in a show. It's clear that Electra is not one of those highly respected elders, and the queens are letting her have it because of that. They all kind of pretty much say something to the effect of, like, Electra's not ready for it, even though she's doing great in the competition. The thing is, Electra makes good TV. But what makes even better TV? Having a robbed queen. Electra is the Miss Cracker, the Katia, the Bindi a crim of this season, our sacrificial fan favorite lamb who we can all cry about on social media. And she was always meant to be that character. She was never going to win. But that's how the cookie crumbles. Frankly though, I'm a little tired of this cookie. It's stale. I'm tired of the overproduction. I'm like, girl, can we just have a little bit of naturality on this TV show, please? For the love of God. Or the devil. Whichever you prefer. But that brings me to my final question slash thought for today's video. Is this season horribly written slash produced? Or is it horribly edited? In other words, is this season exposing shenanigans that may have happened on other seasons of Drag Race that the editors knew how to hide, or are they just being so heavy-handed in their production that they don't care about having an actual competition anymore? Let me know what you think down in the comments. Regardless though, our queens deserve better. As I mentioned, Keita and Electra are in the bottom this week, and I posted an exclusive lip sync and talent show reaction to today's episode over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. You can join my family of patrons for just a couple of dollars a month, support the channel, and get tons of exclusive member benefits. Click the link in the description to join today. See you there. Our winner this week is Scarlett Adams, no surprise, and my hottest hat on the runway is Scarlett Adams. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and this week they've chosen Kidamine. And now for my talent. Oh. 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 See y'all next time. Love ya. Bye. A moment of silence for Drag Race Down Under. It passed away. It had beautiful cuckoo sitting here for makeup, shade, tea, and more. For this season, on behalf of Drag Race, our condolences. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Bussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rat. And yes, it did hurt when I fell from hell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Breaking news, the reviews are in, and according to IMDB, Drag Race Down Under is officially one of the worst user-rated seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race ever. Down Under is currently sitting at an average episodic rating of 5.975 out of 10 stars. It loses only to Drag Race Holland, whose average episodic rating is just 0.037 points lower. For comparison's sake, season 13's rating calculated the same way is 6.631, Canada's is 7.330, All-Star 5 is 7.663, season 12's is 7.836, UK season 2's is 8.210, and Drag Race España is currently the highest rated season of Drag Race to premiere in the past two years with an average episodic rating of 8.425. But that begs the question, why is Drag Race Down Under sitting at the bottom of the barrel? What the hell happened? Today we'll be digging up the lifeless body of Drag Race Down Six Feet Under and performing a little autopsy to determine its cause of flop. Make sure to buckle up because we'll be taking a look back at some of this season's biggest missteps, doing some cross-season comparisons, and then finally we'll complete my hotter rot for this series by taking a look at the finale where Dr. Phil, I mean RuPaul, crowns a winner. Now let's get started. Drag Race Australia was first announced in August of 2019 by Pink News slating RuPaul and Michelle Visage as judges. And then on May 1st, 2021 and seven seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race later, Drag Race Down Under premiered. I don't think anyone could have expected what we ultimately got out of the season, but at least it was full of surprises. I got my first inclination that something might be a little bit off concerning this season when the cast announcement went 
out on Twitter on March 6th. That video featured Michelle Visage and the new third permanent judge, Reese Nicholson, announcing the cast members from what appeared to be the judging panel. The shots of them yelling the contestants' names to what was very obviously an empty stage were spliced together with the actual workroom entrances of each queen. And like the disjointedness of that was weird enough for me, but then the workroom absolutely sent me. Like, <laughs> from the little Cupid statues to the really small lights or just like the small little work neon sign, it just seemed really chaotic and haphazard. Stranger yet, there were no official promo looks to complement this cast announcement. The season itself is also extremely under-promoted in general. Holland, Canada, UK, España, and of course the US seasons all have their own official social media channels. But why not Down Under? Everything just felt rushed, to put it nicely. Rumor has it though that all of this was due to the pandemic. Filming had been pushed back from its original 2020 dates in Australia and moved to January of 2021 in Auckland, New Zealand. Which means, assuming they completed this season sometime in, I don't know, mid-February, that means that the editors and producers had only like 10 weeks to turn this around for the premiere, which is a wild turnaround time for reality television. For example, typical US drag race seasons film the summer of the year prior to their air dates. So rushed? Yeah, it was. Drag race down under? More like drag race Russia. <laughs> However, all things considered, I was happy to overlook some pandemic-related production issues. At least we were still getting a new season of Drag Race. But little did we know, the small cracks in Drag Race Down Under's facade would soon open wide enough for a fist to enter and re-enter. So now let's get into what went wrong. The premiere rolls around and we see our queens walk into the workroom again. 10 fresh queens out of thousands, I'm sure, that applied, right? Wrong. Turns out, Courtney Act actually spilled some tea related to the Drag Race Down Under casting process on her podcast, Brenda Call Me. So the casting process, they didn't put out a call for people to submit auditions for Drag Race, which they normally do. Yeah. And so instead, one of the casting producers uh, just sent messages. But the thing is, it wasn't from an official account. She had an Instagram account that exclusively had photos of those hairless sphinx cats. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these drag queens around Australia and New Zealand like, are getting messages in their DMs in the other folder on their yeah. Instagram accounts from some, like, <laughs> seemingly, I'm sure very lovely, but seemingly crazy cat lady saying, oh, uh, could you please uh, send me an email? I have an important opportunity. I'm like, oh, honey, I've had important opportunities. They're, they're all these important, sorts of apparently. They're all important accounts. Which is just. <laughs> wild. Maybe a little bit of an omen for the production issues that we would have later. And maybe, due to the pandemic, they didn't have an opportunity to run a formal auditions process. Gina already to hand her prance on over to rdrcasting.com. But to me, it smells more like riggery. Like from a technical standpoint, how can this competition be fair if it's invitation only. Anyways, our premiere overall is well received. Users on IMDb rated it an average of 7.1 out of 10 stars, which is pretty good. This was at least higher than season 13's and Holland's premieres, which had both been in the past year. Concerning the next couple of episodes though, we see a confusing series of decisions made by the judges, which ultimately lead to the downfall of the season. Dipping from averages of 6.5 to 6.3 and then to 4.9 in episodes 2, 3, and four, respectively. I already discussed everything that went wrong in the Snatch Game in my episodic review, which I encourage you to go back and watch, but the short of it is that it just was not aired fairly. Some Snatch Game performances were hidden and ignored, like Karen's, and others were overly emphasized for being bad, like, for example, Coco's and Arts. Another issue in the Snatch Game was Etc.'s performance, which made fun of Lindy Chamberlain. I would say this was like 50-50 positive and super negative, depending on who you talk to. So while Etc.'s choice of character for Snatch Game wasn't necessarily the fault of the production, they could maybe have anticipated the blowback from that and maybe asked her to do a different character. At least Anita was like a saving grace in this episode though. For context, the only Snatch Game in the history of Snatch Games to score lower in IMDb user ratings is Drag Race Holland's with a score of 4.1, but we don't need to get into that today. We also recently found out after the finale aired that there were some crazy production related shenanigans going on in this episode 
episode other than what happened in Snatch Game. In a now deleted tweet, Art said, Now that it's over, am I allowed to talk about how they lost the footage and we had to come back days later to film my elimination? And then Coco Jumbo and I had to do that lip sync three times in a row? We knew based off those invitations they were sending out to hand select queens, they were a little unprofessional, but that is unheard of. Definitely would not be fun to relive your elimination. <laughs> three times in one day, much less to come back and redo it later, but at least she got a memeable moment out of it. Overall, I would say most of what happened in the first two episodes was fine. It was fine. I was happily but cautiously tuning into episode three. Unfortunately, that's where we see Coco Jumbo, our last person of color in the competition, eliminated. And while you can argue there whether it was her time to leave the competition or not, this is what sets up the incredible amount of fan backlash we saw leading into and coming from episode four. RuPaul makes the decision to bring back Art Simone. Not Jojo, Coco, and Art Simone, but just Art Simone. And before I talk more about it, I do want to quickly say this was in no way Art's fault or decision, so please don't bother her about this. I don't think there has ever been this much backlash to a queen returning to the competition, ever. Like, usually it's ceremonious. We as an audience are excited to see what this early eliminated queen has to offer. And the reason for queens returning to the competition is not always given. Carmen Carrera, Kenya Michaels, and Nasha Lopez were all brought back in their original seasons with no other reasons given to the audience for them coming back other than Rue or the panel of judges wanted them back. Sometimes, though, returning queens have a little more justification. Trixie Mattel returned to season 7 after winning the makeover challenge with Pearl, and Joe Black in UK Series 2 was voted back in by his peers. So why the problem? Why the uproar? The remaining members of the competition were all white at that point. So while her return technically needed no justification in the context of RuPaul's Drag Race, it did feel like it was lacking in social awareness. And as Coco put on Twitter, it felt like they were just giving the white girl a chance for no reason. And then the icing on the cake for this episode episode was sending home Snatch Game winner and fan favorite Anita Wiglet, who probably shouldn't have been in the bottom anyways. And the person that sent her home, Karen from Finance, was wearing a look that I thought deserved immediate elimination. Like, there was just nothing redeeming about it. That was the moment I realized that, oh, they're gonna push Karen through to the end of this competition no matter what happens. Now, get ready for the big one, episode 5, which is just made worse and compounded by what just happened in episode 4. In this episode, we see RuPaul go for what I think she thought would be her Emmy-winning moment. She calls out Scarlett's past cultural appropriation in blackface and performances, and then forgives her. And look, I do think that Rue tried to do the right thing here, but the optics of already having sent home both people of color from the competition, and then snubbing them from returning to the show in favor of a white contestant, and then having this conversation, and then also sending home the person that was most outspoken against Scarlett in the workroom earlier that episode, were not good. Most importantly though, I think the show missed a huge huge opportunity to build bridges between the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the non-Indigenous populations of these regions. Like, especially since the episode aired during Reconciliation Week. Come on. This episode, by the way, has an average rating of 5.2 stars. Anyways, episode 6 comes along, it's the makeover challenge. I didn't even review this episode, and I don't even know if anybody even noticed because I think so many people stopped watching. Turns out it was actually really cute, and Kitamine got a much deserved win in the competition. And it was the season's second highest user reviewed episode with 7.2 stars. But drum roll, please. Only Drag Race Down Under could mess this up this bad. It all comes crashing down in the seventh episode, The Talent Show. This episode is tied for the worst episode in RuPaul's Drag Race history ever of all the seasons, 26 of them. The one it's tied with, by the way, is the All-Stars 4 finale. Turns out fans did not like that double crowning. It just felt like a wild fever dream of an episode. As a reminder, Karen's balloon animal got a that's it from Michelle and Electra's performance got a, oh, this was so good it should be in a sea of music video. And then they ended up putting Electra in the bottom and sending her home in a lip sync against Kid Amin, who also shouldn't have been in the bottom. Basically, I think the only purpose of this episode was to just show us that this season has indeed been rigged from the start. Anyways, now we get to present day, the finale. I honestly watched this one a little bit begrudgingly. I was like, girl, after that talent show, I don't even care anymore, but I'm glad I did. As a reminder, in our final four is Art with zero wins, Karen with one from episode one, Kida with one from the makeover challenge, and Scarlett with three wins, being from the talent show, design challenge, and Queens Down Under performance challenge. Our final four had to write lyrics for and perform original choreography for a remix to I'm a Winner Baby, and then walk on the runway in their best drag. First up, with the voice of an angel, it's Kidamine. I will say in the main challenge, it was really nice to see her do a serious take on this song. I think in 
any other season, this may have been ignored or pushed aside, but I think it was really important to her journey to self-love that we found out about during the lunch and also in the little section where she's talking to herself as a child. Somehow I went from, I'm still not really sure who this person is, but I like them to, oh my God, I love them and they have a beautiful soul in 55 minutes. This performance was hot. As for her runway, I wonder if it hurt when she fell from the K-hole. Obviously this was beautiful. I love her taking a chance on the mechanical angel wings. And I was kind of wondering if this maybe was an homage to Courtney Ack's original angel wings from her season. I think this look was perfectly paired to her performance and everything else I mentioned previously. Love, light, and happiness. This look was white. <laughs> As for Karen from Finance, she may be breaking glass ceilings in the office, but I'm reporting this outfit to HR. I can deal with the Elvis part of it, but I don't like the K on the belt. It reminds me of that SpongeBob episode where Patrick is like flipping the M around a Wumbo. <laughs> And my other issue with her actual lyrics was, I feel like RuPaul was kind of asking Karen, are you ever gonna step outside of your, you know, Karen from finance office box? And she was kind of like, maybe yes, maybe no. And then her lyrics kind of were related to being in the office regardless of it all. I think I just have to give this a rot. And on the runway, chugga chugga choo choo alakazam. This outfit is perfect for when you have that kid's magic show gig booked at the local mall at three. And then you also have to have that report on your boss's desk by five. I struggled with this look too, because it is quintessentially Karen and it does look well made. So like for only Karen, I do like this for her. I'm gonna give it a hot, but I also hate it. I think it's gonna be another rat. Overall, I wanted to learn more about who Karen from finance actually was, like in her off hours, away from the office. Like, girl, what do you do on the weekends? Tell us. And as for art, her performance and outfit for the main challenge were spunky, funky, funny, just, I think a really great representation of art growing up a little bit in this competition. It felt like she was finally having fun, if just a little bit too late, but this performance was definitely hot. And on the runway, oh my God, she killed the aquamarine teen dream. She kind of looks like one of those little Barbie dolls that you like pull the ripcord on and she like spins around. <laughs> have y'all seen that thing where it like flies into the fireplace? I have no complaints. It's gorgeous, perfect, beautiful, hot. Overall, I can tell there is a queen, not just of Down Under, but of the entire universe within art. And it may take a couple of years for her to come to full fruition, but I want to be there when it happens. Concerning Scarlet, her lyrics were cocky, sexy, fun, funny, exactly what you would expect from a queen like this. And her solo choreography was, I think, undoubtedly the best. She's an excellent dancer, which she already proved on the poll. Definitely hot. For her final runway, I do admit I was a little underwhelmed, but only because of what we had already seen from her in the previous episode. It's just hard to top something like that. So I think if she ever were to compete on Drag Race again, she'll need to be really conscious of, you know, playing her trump card until the very, very end. That said, I think it's excellent to know that she has tones down glamour in her wheelhouse. I think this look was hot. I thought about what I would say about Scarlett in closing, and honestly, it's hard to find words to discuss somebody so controversial. Speaking from the perspective of talent, she had everything she needed to win. And she proved it. She went into the finale with three wins. Yet ultimately, she had no chance of winning. Giving Scarlet the crown would have just been, I think, the cherry on top of a season full of bad optics. I don't think it would have been good for the franchise or for her. Generally speaking, it's a shame how this season mishandled really serious topics that deserved more care. Concerning Scarlet and those topics, I think she should count herself lucky to have been able to share her story on an international platform. Better yet, she was also able to share with the world her talent in drag. Now, it's up to her, I think, to be able to prove her commitment to being a better person and changing not only her life, but those around her and uplifting and helping those communities that are disenfranchised and marginalized in her community. And finally, let's briefly talk about that lip sync to Olivia Newton-John's physical. I have to say, this, I think, was one of the best lip sync for the crowns of all time. Seriously. Everyone was so much fun. Kidamine in particular, and I think the obvious winner of the four for the lip sync. So Kidamine is given the crown, rightly so. I think she really was the only one that could have rightfully won this crown and represented the franchise the best. Turns out a bit of ketamine was exactly what we needed after such a traumatizing season. My hottest hot for the best drag runway goes to Art Simone. I also asked my patrons who their hottest hot was and this week they've chosen ketamine. As for my final thoughts, I think Drag Race Down Under season one is an excellent example of what not to do in future international seasons, but at least they won't forget how it was received and hopefully they can use it uh, to learn how to make the next season 
if it gets renewed. I think a lot of culprits contributed to the disaster of this season. It wasn't just bad judging, and I think the lack of time that they had to actually produce this season just made all that even worse. I do want to remind you that the production of this season was not the Queen's fault, so please continue to support them and don't hold them accountable for something that was outside of their control. And finally, long live Kaita <laughs> I also want to say thank you for tuning into today's video and give a special thanks to my generous patrons who make my channel possible. In exchange for just a couple bucks a month, they get exclusive patron member benefits like exclusive videos, early access to my videos, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. Join my patron family today at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. See you there. See y'all later. Love ya. Bye.